How's it going? How are you doing? How's everybody? Hello, I love that podcast! Will, how's it going? What are you doing? How's it, how's it good. going? Good. I'm, I'm doing good. Doing good. I am, I'm hey. so happy that you're doing hey. good. Hey, everybody. You ever spill a jar of pickles on your kitchen floor and now your whole house smells like pickles? Uh, I sure have. Only coffee. I've never spilled a, a jar of pickles. I'd rather, I'd rather the kitchen and bathroom smell like co- coffee. Isn't that just... Right now. Isn't that just vinegar whatever it is and like i like the smell of pickles but there's only so much a man can take <laughs> i love pickles you love pickles your I do. your your go-to order is a hamburger only pickles yes because it's because as a basic bitch there's no more basic than that and you know what you could do a lot with that honestly i i i think most people get no pickles yeah those people are wrong <laughs> Will, Especially you, Alex. Yes, Bob. <laughs> we want to today. We want to talk about Metroid for a good chunk of this because, yes. in, in a rare occurrence, we both played a game. <laughs> yes. Usually it's just one of us, but this time we both of, yeah. played it. And yes. there's also some news around that game, and also, uh, mm-hmm. well, we'll get into it. Uh, we also got to talk about this. Some, there's some switch OLED issues that arise today. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. The screen it flickers. Oh God, everything oh, sucks. That's... Yeah, and also, we got news on the Joy Cons. Yes, which may or may not be a good thing. Probably and, not. And a bunch of other stuff. But first, Will, I want to ask you: You went to Comic Con? I was. I did go to Comic Con. It was surreal. I went on Saturday, and that's the more crowded day. Yes. Um, but it still was not very crowded. It was honestly the ideal size for a comic book convention i could move freely (laughs) i wasn't like crowded around booths trying to look at stuff i didn't have to do you know one of these to like squeeze through people all that often i think i only did it twice (laughs) it was magical oh my god i like i wish there were more pandemics during comic con (laughs) so there wouldn't be this many people there (laughs) so i went on thursday and yeah. uh yeah there there i was sh- i was shocked by how empty it was i i, I mean yeah. so like like i understand it's empty there's a pandemic and whatnot that may it makes a lot of sense um but uh it also was thursday so that when i went so yeah. it, thursday's usually less crowded but there were barely like there's half as many vendors also which i guess makes yeah. sense because it wasn't as crowded but yeah, i was a there little weren't any major vendors I was a little disappointed because because every year Comic Con's been more, or at least the past couple of years, it's felt like the same stuff. Um, but this yeah. year, it felt like the same, but missing some stuff. Right. It, fe- it definitely felt like there was less of it. But honestly, Comic Con was getting way too big for its own good, and yeah. I think this scaled back version of it was refreshing. And it's just a, such a nice change of pace. I mean, yeah, it would have been nice if there were more things there. It would have been nice, you know, if there were a lot more interesting booths. Like, a lot of the show floor was just taken up by a land party section, which was a nice idea. Yeah. But, so, so that was another know. interesting thing. Like, uh, so, so Comic-Con is set up by the same people who do pax and pax always has yeah. like this free play pc gaming area where it's just a bunch of pc games loaded up with with uh it's a bunch of pcs loaded up with the latest games so everybody can like sit there and land together or play online or whatever yeah. um and it, at comic-con they never have that because it's a comic book convention but they always have a Yu-Gi-Oh playing area it's a Yu-Gi-Oh booth it's a giant Yu-Gi-Oh booth and yeah. that has all these tables for people to play Yu-Gi-Oh together and they do tournaments and stuff that Yu-Gi-Oh booth was gone and it was replaced with a PC gaming area, which was yeah. very it, it, an interesting choice. Um, yeah. Other than that, I was a little disappointed. The, the I usually go to this booth called Bluefin. It's a it's a toy like booth that has they usually have Mega Man's yeah. and, and other like Japanese uh, uh, stuff. Um, they have uh, they're right next to this other one. I think it's Toei. Um, uh, they were there. And they had Gundams and and Dragon Ball Z figures and stuff, but they didn't have any uh, 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 of the of the gaming stuff that I wanted. 
Um, yeah. Also, uh, Kim Jong Ji or Kim Jong Gi wasn't there because how the hell is he gonna get here from Korea? But yeah. he wasn't in Artist Alley. So like, I feel and I feel like a lot of these companies that are maybe foreign would uh, didn't come this time because it would have been oh, hard yeah. for them. Uh, so it's not really it's not really the cons' fault that that I felt like yeah. it was it was missing some stuff because I mean it's the pandemic's fault. Also, yeah. the reason why there wasn't that many people was because they required vaccination, which I think was a necessity. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to fault them for that either. You yeah, know, like, they required vaccination and masks. So yes. you had you had to have both. Now I went to too many games this weekend. Yes. Yes. Which tell, tell us about that required masks, but did not require right. vaccination. Okay. We went to too many games two years ago and the year before that, I yeah. believe. Yes. My God, Will. It was the same yeah. size, but uh -huh. twice as many people. Really? It was nuts. <laughs> it, I, it, you talk about having to squeeze through people, Will. I couldn't. It was. It took me. Wow. It, it took us like, like an hour and a half, two hours to get through the whole thing. Right. To like snake our way through, but also because we were getting stopped. There were a lot of people who were there for YouTubers. It was it was it was insane. Um yeah. but uh yeah, there's there, there were people are gonna get sick from that. There's no way. <laughs> there there was too many people yeah. bumping up again rubbing up against each other. Yeah. Um but it was fun, at least. Uh that's good. I mean we're all we wore masks, so we did what we what we could. Yeah. Anyway, uh so yeah, uh I, I I hope the next Comic Con. Uh, I hope we get this all figured out by the next Comic Con. Yeah, I'm not. I don't I have little yeah, faith I'm, I'm in, sure. in the city, but well, I have very little faith in Reed Pop because you know, actually being at Comic Con never really is a problem. Trying to go to Comic Con, trying to oh. get a fucking ticket, right, is always a problem. I had to try three times this year to get a ticket. <laughs> So, I Repop also puts on PAX. I never have a problem with PAX. I love PAX. It's right. my favorite convention. Uh, PAX East specifically. I haven't been to West though. Um, but yeah, I love PAX East, and I love what Repop does with PAX East. Comic Con, there's some tomfoolery that happens pretty frequently. Yeah. Uh, uh, usually, I like it though. Usually, it's good. Yeah. Uh, Willow says I am surprisingly feeling okay despite several hugs at too many games uh i hugged him multiple times yeah um but yeah no i listen my con strategy is always uh sleep a lot as much as you can uh yeah. purell very frequently or just wash your hands mm -hmm. uh and drink a lot of water and i did all of those things and of course you got to eat food yeah i did all of those things and right now i feel fine so yeah uh whatever i'm doing what i can here uh anyway uh thank you for coming to too many games whoever did i'm glad uh i got to see some of you it was a good time uh anyway uh guys oh we got notifications here oh my god we got a lot i didn't realize uh we got bear 1598 with seven months thanks guys for just being you well thank you for being you're you. welcome thank you for coming by gcxc luke thank you for the nine months i appreciate it kikoba thank you for the 23 months you're wrong about metroid having boss baby vibes it is very clearly channeling boss baby 2 i don't i've only ever seen the original boss baby i've never seen any other movie so that's why it gives me those vibes uh thrill house 1980x thank you for the 100 bits was cool meeting you friday bob hope my dis d description of the Wawa Gobbler Hoagie didn't ruin Wawa for you, LOL. Okay, so here's another story, Will. Okay, yes. You know how the Too Many Games Hotel is right by the Wawa. You're yes. familiar with that. Yes. So you know that I Wawa. I've frequented that Wawa many a times. You know that that's a very important uh, place to, to... It's very important to, to the Too Many Games experience is that Wawa. Yeah. Um, yes. So I was with Hannah, and she has never been to Wawa ever in her life. Oh, so we, oh, I hope you gave her an education. We went to Wawa on Saturday. Uh, mm -hmm. She loved it. She was like, that was incredible. 
<laughs> we actually we went up to we went in there and she and she was just walking around. I was like, go to the screen. She was like, there's a screen. You order on that. So. So we had it on Saturday. The next day we decided we went to some fancy coffee place and we were like, we're going to Wawa. Yeah. We're not even going to eat breakfast here. We're going to go to Wawa. And we went to Wawa and, and Wood was like trying to get food. And we were like, oh, we're going to Wawa. So we went to, so he, he, he him and his crew was going to go, they were going to go to Moe's. I also okay. fucking love Moe's. But it was breakfast time for me, so I was like, I gotta get Wawa. I'm not. I just had a coffee. I'm not having Moe's right after that. So yeah. he convinced his whole crew to go to Wawa. We all get to Wawa. They're out of eggs. <laughs> oh. But they didn't like make it clear that they were out of eggs. So you just order yeah. something, and it just didn't come with eggs. So the Wawa experience on Sunday was ruined for a lot of people. But for me, I just made my thing into a sandwich, and everything was fine. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Where was I going with that? I don't remember. Uh, I didn't uh, get the gobbler, unfortunately. Right. But I did. But I my Wawa experience the first day nine out of ten. Second day, I'll give it a six. It ended up being okay because I basically just made Good, a sandwich. Not great. Fans of the genre should find something to like about it, though. There is a coffee place called Ebrew that is also close to that area, and it was it. That was a ten out of ten. That was Isn't awesome. Isn't there a Starbucks like right across the street from Wawa, though? There is, but that had a crazy drive-through line. I didn't want to. I didn't want to do it. Makes sense. The, yeah. the Wawa coffee zero out of ten. The the really? the, the, the the like little like frappuccino knockoff they have watery as all hell. The latte they had, I I, I watered it down with with their coffee, and it still tasted like shit. Um, but I mean. I don't. I shouldn't have expected much. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, we got more notifications. I'm so sorry. We'll get to Metroid in a yeah. second. Don't worry. Everybody, all your horses. Uh, wait. That was Thrill House who told me that. That's crazy. C. C Calvi, <laughs> thank you for the six months. I appreciate it. Kate, thank you for the subscription. Gator Darren, thank you for the 17 months. Thanks for the great content, bros. Thank you, Gator Darren. Dark type. Thanks for the hundred bits. Come to PAX West next year so I don't have to explain to my work why I'm trying to get a weekend off to go see some YouTubers across the country. I definitely plan on going to too many games. Uh, we'll yes, too many games, but also PAX West next year. There's also talks for Retropalooza. I don't know. Wait, is that what it's called? Oh, where is that? No, no, not Retropalooza. Uh, SoCal Retro. Okay. That's in February. I don't know about that, though. That was literally okay. just brought to my attention today. Um. I know oh, there's more? also the Portland Go. Retro Gaming Expo, which I've heard is massive. Uh, I I don't want to go too far for a retro gaming expo. However, right. I keep putting off going to LA, and there's people I need to see in LA, and I keep just right. putting it off, and everybody's mad at me. Um, I, there's one more thing I want to show before we get started here. Right. Okay, wonder what is it? Show and tell. I got a couple things from too many games. I okay. got I got a I got this Mario pin which is which is cute. It's the uh it's the uh it's the uh what's it called? What do you call it? Um Paper Mario, Paper Mario. style. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I do the the top down? Oh, I didn't set up that camera. Whatever. It's a, it's the Paper Mario Mario. It's very cute. All right. I also got uh uh Link's Awakening for the original Game Boy. Nice. I also got this will check this out. Oh my god. What it's, is that? It's oh, is that an NES cartridge holder? You guessed it, Will. It's nice. in a freaking beautiful condition. Wow. It was $50 though. <laughs> but this would be That's a good a, this will be a good prop for some videos and stuff. Yeah. That'd be good to hold our NES games in. We, also I think, that. How many does How many does that hold? I think like 15. Okay. We have you a little know, more than that, but We we do? Yeah, I think we do. No, we don't have that many. I'll ch I'll check the list. Okay. Anyway, we got Ukia with 200 bits. Bob, I have been a casual coffee drinker for a while, but I subscribed to Trade and it's been great. Just wanted to say thanks. Yo, Ukia, uh, you're welcome. I hope you have a good time. I hope you enjoy your coffee experience. I got a lot of coffee questions this weekend. Um. Well, I mean, you're known as the coffee YouTuber. That's what you specialize in. Yes, yes. Only that. Nothing else. 
Yep. Uh, is Bob going to keep the Game Boy Link's Awakening sealed or play it on his Game Boy Color or Wolf Den G Game Boy? Guys, two things. One, I don't know what makes you assume I got it sealed. That would be so expensive. <laughs> Yeah, I got just the cartridge. And two, uh, if you want to purchase one of these Wolf Den Game Boys, they are still available right now over at uh, 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 Game Changer Game Mods. Yes, the Game Changer Mods Etsy. Thank you, Will. Um, yes. I'm gonna get you one of those. You gotta, you gotta oh. get one. Oh. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, he texted me today saying that they gotta like actually order the cases. So. Get your order in right okay. now, or else you're never going to get it again. Uh, anyway, go so yeah, go to Game Changer Mods on Etsy. Let's talk about Metroid. Yeah, let's. So, Metroid uh, Dread. So, the uh, fifth game in the chronology, the eleventh game overall. So I have I consider myself a Metroid novice. Um, I played the very first Metroid as a child because my roommate my current my now roommate had the game in like first grade when we used to hang out and i used to yeah. play it at his house all the time never got anywhere in the game was very confused by it um uh and i played it here and there throughout the years but i also i never really got that far um barely touched super metroid um i played a little bit of samus returns uh the ds the 3ds remake uh and i didn't really like it that much um it was it was good for a little bit but it was very 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 repetitive um right. it was the same boss over and over and over again but they'd add a little something but sometimes they wouldn't add a little something sometimes it would just be annoying uh i played metroid fusion all the way through loved the hell out of metroid fusion um and i played a little bit of the first metroid prime and that's that's all that's my whole metroid experience yeah i didn't get into metroid until metroid prime and metroid fusion because those came out on the same day mm -hmm. and they were like that was also around the time we were like more aware of video when video games are coming out like we were following hype cycles because before that it was just whatever people got us for christmas mm -hmm. um and this time, like th th around this time, we were beginning to become more aware of like games are coming out, what games are potentially good and whatnot. Um, so we got those and I didn't really like get into them and play them like I played them when they came out. But I like really, really played them much later. Never beat either of them. I don't remember where I got up to Infusion, but Prime, I got up to the final boss and it was too hard so i never bothered <laughs> um i think i looked at the ending on youtube like forget it um but then after that like it, it was always a series like i love those games and it was always a series i wanted to keep playing with but just never really got to doing like i i played around a little bit with metroid zero mission i played around a little bit of metroid prime 3 um it wasn't until like this year where i seriously tried playing super metroid which a lot of people say is like the greatest game of all time and having played with it i could see why people say that because it is really really good it really is one of the best super nintendo games period um and i tried playing the original metroid the nes version hot take that <laughs> game sucks the game is not good there's very uh, very few good nes games and i stand by that you know what the problem is with that game? And then we'll get into Dread. You, you start off, your blaster only shoots about two feet in front of you. Yeah. And all the enemies in the beginning are nowhere near, like, your blast range. They're either on the ground or fly at you up high. And you can't really, like, aim your right. gun. Right. So it's, like, useless. Mm -hmm. And you're like that for a lot of the game. So... Play Zero Mission instead. This is the Game Boy Advance remake. Mm -hmm. um, what is Metroid but, 3? That's Super Metroid. Oh, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Because um, Metroid 2 then is there was, the Game Boy one that was remade yes. for the 3DS. Yes. And then there was a long gap. We didn't really get another Metroid game for a long time. We got, like, Other M, which nobody likes. We got Federation Force, which even less people like. Uh, but now we have an actual true blue 2D size rolling Metroid game. It is Metroid Dread, and it is fantastic. 
Uh, Metroid Zero Mission is also fantastic. I, I very much yes. like Zero Mission, uh, and I hope that they give us that in some capacity on the Switch because it's it's, yeah. it's impossible to play right now. There's like no way well, to get it. It's available on the I think it's available on the 3DS and the Wii U. Right. Right now, the Wii U is the best place to play the majority of Metroid games <laughs> because that has pretty much all of them except um, the second one. I would like to address Searist in the chat. It says, for anyone who that's f more familiar with Metroid, does it matter if I play out or out of order? I'm in the middle of Super Metroid, but I really want to play by Dread. Uh, I'm going to change this question because I thought it was going to be something else. Uh, the frequently asked question I get about Metroid Dread is, does it matter yes. if I'm new to Metroid, uh, if, if I'm new to the Metroid series? I think this answers the same for Cy Cyrus over here. Uh, yeah, just play... Metroid Dread, it does not matter. The story is almost matter. irrelevant in, in, in Metroid. Yeah. I would say it it's completely has, irrelevant. It has a story, but it's really more context. Like, mm -hmm. it tells you, like, it sets it up, and then it just go on, you know, go about your own devices. Metroid has, all the Metroid games have lore, like, deep and interesting backstory, but all of that is irrelevant once Samus steps foot on the planet she's exploring, because then it's just explore the world. Yeah. Everything else is secondary. Yeah, so a lot of Metroid games follow the same formula. They front load it with story. So like like once you turn the game on, they're like, this is what's happening. And they give you like like yeah. a like a slideshow cutscene of what's happening. And then the game just lets you go. And like Samus doesn't even talk like like there's no dialogue like nothing happens every once in a while you might get like a computer telling you something but it's just content it's just it's just what your mission is basically or what's happening in the world yeah. it, it's it's not it's not a lore thing um yeah if you played more metroid you might get more excited for some callbacks like sometimes they'll bring back an enemy like ridley is is like in yeah. basically every zelda game uh, yeah zelda. and is in basically every, every Metroid, Metroid game. game. So you see him and you're like, well, yeah. it's Ridley. Um, but otherwise, there's the story is 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 not there. There's you don't have to worry about the yeah. story at all. The, the story is like is like a paragraph in a Wikipedia article. It's it's not important at all. Yeah, it's it's just basically to give you context for what you're doing, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, so it's very easy to to just. I mean. Well, let me get this out of the way. Metroid Dread is a very hard game, <laughs> but it is. Uh, it is uh, very easy to just pick this up if you've never played a Metroid game before. Yes. Uh, but uh, yeah, let me get back to that. It is a hard game. Uh, do not get this game if you get frustrated easily by dying because you will yes. die a lot in Metroid Dread. Um, also, obtuseness because all the Metroid games are um, they're not hard in the sense of like finding your way but they can be very obtuse as to what you have to actually do in order to progress um and this game is pretty obtuse from the beginning i would say like i actually had to reload a save file because i got lost yeah that's and I'm not very far i really don't like games where i have to figure out what to do and where to go i like i like yeah. linear games However, mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason, I had a great time with Metroid Fusion. I had a good time with Castlevania. And those are games where you need to yeah. backtrack a lot and just run around and try to figure stuff out. It's a little easy because you get a new item and like that's the item that you use yeah. uh, to figure out what to do next. Um, but there are certain points where like you have to... There's like hidden uh, hidden like spots in the wall that you have to shoot that you never would have... There's no indication at all that you would have to do that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm playing on here on Twitch, and so I have chat helping me every once in a while if I get, like, too lost. So that, yeah. that's a little easier. Um, but that's not why the game's hard. The game's hard because uh, the enemies are very hard. Like, yes. uh, you have those Emmys, these guys. Yeah. That are... Oh, God, I dropped the other Emmy, though. Oh, God. <laughs> these guys are following gonna... you around. And and they uh and, and they're you they're basically unbeatable until you get a certain uh a power up. Yeah. So yeah. Uh I mean the good thing about the Emmys is that they're only in a certain area, so you know what area to avoid, but inevitably you do have to get into that area to either 
progress or get to another side of the map. So while you're there, it becomes a stealth game, but it is the hardest stealth game <laughs> you have ever played. It is. It, you can't walk unless you put on the cloak suit. Uh, yeah. So you, every time you move, it alerts them to a sound. Uh, mm -hmm. But it makes you feel so badass when you when you juke one of the Emmys. Cause, cause yeah. you have to get them kind of close to you, and then you sometimes you have to like jump over them and stuff. But if they tap you, you are dead. Yeah, they, they that say is in the it. they say in the game there's a one percent chance you can parry their attack. So then when you parry the attack, it makes you feel like a badass. <laughs> Yeah. There's a lot in the game that makes you feel like a badass. But again, yeah. uh, you might... Also, there's no lives, so you can just start over whenever you want. Um, and the, and yeah. there's some and, pretty and forgiving checkpoints. Yes, I was going to say, this game actually has like a very good checkpoint system where mm -hmm. like the previous games didn't. Like It will start you off right at the room, right at the door to the room you just died in, which is nice. Yeah, so uh, it... it 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 I I like the difficulty a lot, but after like the fourth time I died to the same Emmy, I I picked up the 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 game case and I was like, this what the hell is this game rated? Because this is not for kids. That like a kid no. would get frustrated and stop playing this yeah. game. It is yeah, no, it rated is... T. Believe it or not, yeah, I, I did not realize. I believe that. it. I think all the Metroid games are rated T. I didn't know that. That's crazy. I think. Well, Metroid has always been like. Nintendo's serious <laughs> series. Right. You know, you have like Mario, which is clearly, you know, for kids and for all ages. And you have Zelda, which is a little bit older, but it's still like got all this whimsy and fantasyful stuff about it. And then you got Metroid, which is just you alone in the bleak, black emptiness of space. And there's a lot of scary shit. <laughs> and it's like, your main character, like you never see their her face, so she always looks like she's mad all the time. Um, and it's Nintendo's like serious adult series. They do a so, great job making you feel alone. Yes, it, yes, it, that it, was it, one of the best parts of Super Metroid and Metroid Prime, and, and they capture that here. And the Emmys kind of feel like uh, uh, uh Mr. X and uh, and uh the nemesis and, and all that stuff in Resident yeah. Evil where they chase you the whole freaking game. Yeah. Um, anyway, Lonosis in the chat says, ouch, I didn't realize it's full priced. Uh, that's another weird thing. Like just because it's 2d people are like upset that it costs $60. This game has more quality and more polish in it than a lot of other $60 games. Yes. Like you will get your money's worth for this game. Mm hmm. Uh, I, you know what? I want to talk about this later. No, you know, we'll talk about it now. Uh, brief aside, I got I played uh, Nicktoons All-Stars Brawl like two days ago for the first time. Okay. That game fucking sucks. It's so <laughs> bad. It's not... They never finished the game. The game's not finished. The game disconnects your controller every time you go to the main menu. And you have to go to the main menu God. every time you're done with the match. So you just freaking lose... You just lose your connection to your controller every time. And that only happens on the Switch version. But that's the version that I want to play the freaking game on. Right. Uh, none of the moves make any sense. You know how I'm like... Normally a light attack is like fast and a hard... And, and like a harder attack or strong attack is slow doesn't fucking matter yeah. just whatever attack does whatever the hell they feel like some of them go like insanely fast some of them are slow as molasses freaking uh the powder toast man his rapid jab which is a knockoff of of uh captain falcon it's so uh -huh. freaking slow um you have no idea when you're gonna get launched off the stage it's just it feels like mm -hmm. it's completely random uh some of the moves are so broken you could just spam them and kill the other person no matter what you could fill the stage up with projectiles if you want it's so fucking stupid the game is garbage <laughs> it the menu system i saw like i was looking at reviews of it and like the menu system just looks so barren yeah and empty yeah like, that, that, that looks shockingly unfinished <laughs> There's a lot of uh, UI issues. Like it's just, it, yeah. it, it's ugly. Uh, a lot of the menus are ugly. Uh, the the fighter screen when you start a game is a complete knockoff of Smash, but it's ugly as all hell. Some of the fighters don't look like they match yeah. at all. Um, what else? If you pick, there's no character skins. So if you pick the same character as me, too bad. We just don't know who's who. That's just the end of that. Yeah. Um, it's bad. It's, it's, it, it's 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 horrible um guess the metacritic for that game <laughs> i think it was like 70 when i saw it yeah is it a flat 70 
It's seventy for Switch and Xbox. On PS5, it's like sixty-seven. It should so be like one, it, sh it should be yeah. a five. That game is so bad. The people who reviewed it either were too afraid to give it a bad review, or uh, they uh, or uh, they they just never play have never played a fighting game before in their life. Um, I feel like if it's almost impossible to have never played a fighting game in 2021 i know yeah or they're mashers they could just be mashers i'm sure it's fine if you're Probably. a masher but if you're trying to figure out like how characters work it's <laughs> absolute garbage we're talking about nick tunes guys i took a brief aside to talk about nick tunes but yeah. we were supposed to be talking about metroid <laughs> yeah <laughs> um game that's not garbage metroid dread yes um fantastic i had another problem with the stupid sodding game uh whatever uh, it's just it, it's yeah. It just doesn't. The game just doesn't make any sense. It it needed like another year to release, but they just rushed yeah. it out. Uh, I I I don't think it's the developer's fault. I think it's the publisher's fault. I think they they tried to force it out because a lot yeah. of these licensed games they they don't give a shit. Uh, they just want the marketing to go along with it. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, sorry about that. Let's talk more about Metroid. Um, yeah. I'm not very far in it. Uh, Neither am I. I got to the I third sector, to... and I I think I'm like midway yeah. through the third sector. I might have opened the did fourth you get the one. Morph I don't remember. Ball yet? I did get the morph ball, and I got the bomb. Okay. I got the bomb for okay. it. I did not beat Kraid yet. I'm up to Kraid, and I did I, not beat him yet. I beat Kraid and got a little past that. Um, yeah. I am now just learning of the sequence break where you can, if you get the grapple beam and the morph ball bomb early. You can beat Kraid easier. Yeah, I didn't like know you needed the right? grapple beam, but I did know you needed the morph ball and the yeah. bomb. I think you need it because you need the grapple beam to get the morph ball bomb. I did. There's a way to get that out of sequence. I, I don't think I, I got. Not... I don't think I got the grapple beam. Oh really? Yeah, I think I just got the bomb. Uh, but so, I did. I didn't do that sequence though. I didn't do the Kraid. I beat Kraid. Yeah with what i had um yeah and it was so very I'm hard i'm trying to be Kraid as is Kraid. when i played in, in super metroid that was a boss like i need to like walk away from and then come back and like i got the pattern down this one is is a lot different from the, the way it is in super metroid his moves are different his mentality is different he's still stationary mm -hmm. and like it's just you stand there and you attack him but it, it doesn't it doesn't feel anything like it did in Super Metroid. They really did a good job of like changing it up and surprising you with how to fight him. He has a uh, one move that is a one hit kill. <laughs> he God. just he just punches you. He just if you're yeah. if you're in like the top left corner, he just winds up and he punches you once and it's a one hit kill. You're dead. Oh. I think I had a full tank and it just knocked all my health out. Um but uh just make sure he doesn't do that. <laughs> then you yeah. should be fine. <laughs> but no, it all, it took me like three or four tries to to beat Crate. So it wasn't it wasn't too yeah. bad. Um, yeah. But again, the the boss design is 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 incredible, and 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 yeah. uh, it 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 feels really good to have different types of bosses partnered with the Emmys that are stalking you, and you need different yeah. abilities to 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 kill and whatever. Um, yeah. But in, in in Metroid uh, Two or Samus Returns, the remake I made, it was the same boss. I think you had to beat him like sixteen times or something. It was yeah. so uh, I was so annoying. That um, might just be a holdover from the fact that that's a Game Boy uh, original Game Boy game, right? That they had to remake for the 3DS. Yeah, that. Which in that case, they could have done a better job of like redoing the bosses. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely an original Game Boy game. I I might have liked yeah. it more if I just played it on Game Boy. Maybe I'll get it on Game Boy. Maybe I'll try that. Um, I thought this is a 2.5D game. Uh, I hate that term. I hate 2.5D because <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. It's it's a 3D side scroller. That's what it is. 2.5D used to mean like games like Doom and Duke Nukem 3D, right. where it was like all sprites, but they made it look pseudo 3D. Now it just means a 3D game that's also a side scroller. Yeah, I think so. pe people don't put enough uh, value behind uh, side-scrolling games or, or platformers. Yeah, pe pe People see a platformer and they say, there's no depth to this game. Yeah. Meanwhile, Which is Metroid close. uses every button on the controller. Um, yes. 
And uh, except for the D-pad. I don't think you can use the D-pad. Um, I thought you could. I don't think it does anything. Um, no, I, I definitely tried it in the beginning, uh, and it doesn't move. <laughs> That's for sure. But I don't know if it does <laughs> yeah. anything else in the game. Uh, underscore says map. Um, it in I know in the map screen if you press down it like closes one of your menus. Okay, but that's about it. Bob hasn't unlocked it yet. <laughs> uh, D pad is just the map. Okay. So also this game has uh, it, it's it's a giant world. Like yeah, like just because it's two D doesn't mean that the map isn't massive. Um, oh yeah, the map is huge. I think like. Because it's broken up into, I think, like five different sections, but like one section is the size of your average Metroid ripoff. <laughs> so, five of those. <laughs> so, the only thing that uh, I could see being a good argument for this game being too expensive is that the game is a little short for a $60 game. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it only clocks in at eight hours, nine and a half if you do some extra stuff if you don't like plow through the main story and if you're a completionist it only takes about 12 hours 11 and a half 12 hours so that's pretty that's not that much content but honestly right. i wish every game was eight hours <laughs> yeah eight hours I mean, is the that... perfect length of a game for me because i just want to get the game over with and move on to the next game there's too many fucking and games like... That's eight hours you know taking into consideration how many times you die how mo- often you get lost uh, if you're getting every upgrade or just the, the basic ones, the story important ones. So that can vary. That can be as short as three hours because people are trying to speed run this game right now. Um, and it can be as long as like 20 hours. And, like it's all possible. People are saying a game uh, like this can, be, can go either way. People are saying that the completionist uh, time is not accurate. The, uh, the 12 hours because yeah. it, once you beat it once, it unlocks a hard mode. Oh. So that should yeah, double the main that. story time. I might consider doing hard mode just really? because I think the game is like awesome. But I, I, I don't want it. I kind of don't want it to end yeah. in eight hours. But and I think that would make yeah, for no. good Twitch content. One thing I, I'm upset about with this game is that I kind of just want to play it. But I feel like I, I'm obligated to play it on stream now because I'm trying to do a playthrough. Uh, but I kind of just yeah. want to play it like uh, just just on my leisure time. So. I'm upset because I have adult responsibilities <laughs> and I never <laughs> had the chance to play it. Maybe I'll play it while I'm editing the podcast. Like I'm this. going uh, away this weekend and like yeah. uh, I want to play this game, but I can't. I have to wait until yeah. I'm back to stream. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so so people need to know if this is a game that they should get. Uh, I would say almost unequivocally yes. Unless you have like a real aversion to two D platformers for some reason, yeah, or or, or uh, 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 games that aren't so linear, you might yeah. have to figure it, out what you're doing a little bit. That that yeah. Now I normally hate games like that, but I like this one. There's enough good shit and great level yeah. design where I don't feel like it's a burden to have to backtrack a little bit. Yeah. Also, too, it it does kind of guide you. Yeah. But it doesn't make you feel like an idiot mm-hmm. for it. Like, because a lot of games of this ilk will just flat out tell you where you need to go. Um, Metric Fusion kind of did this too. Um, the difference, this game doesn't tell you where to go, but the level design and the way the game is structured, it sort of like guides you into that direction so that, you know, you feel smart for knowing which way to go, even though you've never explored this map before. Yeah, like you get the morph ball, and then you, and then the game doesn't say anything. You're like, okay, now what? And then you walk, yeah, you you walk out of the room where you got the morph ball, and you're like, oh, there's a little tiny hole I can fit into now. And then you go into there, and then it opens up a whole new area. So, and not only that, you can now go back because you know you'll see tracks for where the morph ball should go. And if you played Metroid before, you know, oh, that's where for the morph ball. Yeah, so if you, you look, go back to those areas, and even you if you the look morph ball there, even if you look on the map, you'll see little little corridors yeah. on the map that that are like kind of grayed out and you're like oh i i can now go there so then that you make a mark yeah. on the map and you go over there uh just mm-hmm. to see what's over there 
Uh, I did spend like a like an hour last night just wandering around trying to see like going to areas like I, I got a new beam for the new beam gun. And I was like, OK, well, this opens a certain type of door. Let's go see where those doors yeah. are. And I went to wherever I thought that door was. And f- eventually I got to an area that yeah. uh, that I needed to go to. Uh, so, yeah, I, the the linearity isn't really an issue to me, even though that's usually an issue to me. Yeah. Um, my uh, I had my Japanese class today, Will, and my teacher asked uh, what game I'm playing, and I said, "Oh, I'm playing Metroid yeah. Dread." And then he asked, "What type of game is that?" <laughs> and I said, "Platformer isn't a word in English. <laughs> it's whenever I like write it, it 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 tries to autocorrect it, and and like yeah. uh, it's it's not like a dictionary term. It's just not a word. Oh. It's just a word we use to describe oh. the a type of game." So I was like, well, so that word definitely doesn't exist in Japanese. Right. Also, the other type of game that Metroid is, is a Metroidvania Metroid game. Metroidvania, <laughs> yeah. So that word also probably doesn't exist. I've heard it <laughs> referred to as search action. Oh. But I don't, I don't know how common a phrase that is. I have never heard that. I've heard it like once or twice because it's an action game. We have to do a lot of searching. Yeah. Search action. I don't know. I I wouldn't. I wouldn't use that. <laughs> I wouldn't use that. I have never heard that before in my life. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's funny to like define the type of game with the mm-hmm. word. You know, you're defining it with yeah. the word that it is. Uh, somebody else in the chat just said, "I don't like stealth sections in games. Is it?" The only reason I am hesitant to get it, go fish, go, go fish, goldfish, watch some gameplay because yeah, uh, the stealth isn't really stealth. It's not like you have to sneak or, I mean, you do have to kind of sneak around, but like it's yeah. fast paced. Like yes. you're really playing tag and yeah. the other guy's it. <laughs> you're just, yeah. you're just running away from the thing. It's very yeah. heart pounding. Yes. You can escape the Emmy. Cause so like, it's all on- the Emmys only live, like I said, in a certain section of the map. So if you enter that section and the Emmy sees you, it is possible, so as long as you know what you're doing, to get to the other side of the map and get through the exit where the Emmy can't chase you. If the Emmy catches you, though, just let it let it do what it needs to do and start it over again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let it do what it needs to do. I, That's one way to put ev- it. Every. Every time it catches me, I keep hitting counter. I keep spamming counter to think I'll get it. It happened once. Mm. It feels good, though. Never again. Oh, yeah. It feels real good. I did it like three times. And, and one oh, of them yeah. was on the... You get two chances. Yeah. It like knocks you down and then it and then it like comes in for a second strike. Uh, yeah. One of the times was that second strike. And if I feel like the second strike yeah. might be harder. Oh, that's um, definitely harder. Um, What was I going to say? Um... I I completely forgot. Um, yeah, I I I'd say the, the stealth part isn't really. If you, if you're afraid of stealth games or you don't like stealth games, definitely look up some gameplay so you can get a feel of what the type of stealth is. When you see one of these yeah. guys on screen, that's the stealth part people are talking about. It might not even look like stealth to you. Yeah. Um, but it does feel really good to avoid them. Anyway, uh, I'm not that far into the game. I'm like less than halfway through. Uh, but I think it is. I'm not even that far. What it's definitely one of the best games on the Switch, and uh, yes. it might be the game of the year overall entirely, to be completely honest. Yes. I mean, I'm a bad judge of that because I haven't played any other 2021 games, mm-hmm. um, but this is definitely game of the year contender. No questions asked. Uh, I think we- if you're if you need it, if you need a new game for the Switch this season, this is it. Uh, if you haven't played your Switch in a while, this is the reason to pick it up again. Oh, I want to say there's one uh, there's, there's one thing that Adam... Adam is like your suit, I think? Or is it your Adam, ship? It's like the AI. Oh, no. Adam is your AI. He, is, mm. he debuted in Metroid Fusion, and then in Metroid Other M, which I should note is the most story-focused Metroid game, and that's the game everybody hates, um, <laughs> it's revealed that Adam was your commanding officer so no no Samus other m named... is the one that everybody hates yeah i said other m oh okay 
Yeah. But he was in. He started in At, Fusion, then he was in Other M. You're saying the AI was in Fusion. The okay. AI, the AI was in Fusion, and Samus called him Adam because she remi- the AI reminded her of Adam Malkovich, who you see in Metroid Other M, the game uh, everybody hates. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah I understand. Uh, anyway, there was a part in the game where Adam says, uh, he basically says like, uh, "There's nothing you can do." Accept your helplessness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah. I guess that's where we're at in the game then. Yeah. Yeah, the game the game gets it. They, they do a really good job making you feel like you're fucked in this game. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, what? So they just re- re- reconned Other M for Dread? No, that's not what they said. No, no. The, the uh, Metroid d- series... Because I, I was watching... Other M is a prequel, it sounds like. Other M takes place right after Super Metroid. Okay. I was watching uh like GameStop's uh, Metroid lore video or whatnot, and they basically run through all the Met- the story of all the Metroid games. And it seems like, especially with the remakes, uh, Zero Mission and Samus Returns, Nintendo or whoever's developing developing it has a habit of going back and adding a lot of backstory and lore and content. To basically flesh out this overarching Metroid story that apparently is so important. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a lot of information in the original Metroid. There's not a lot of information in the original Metroid game. There's none at all. But Zero Mission adds like all this context to the the Chozo history and the creation of the Metroids. And then Samus Returns adds even more history of the Chozo and, <laughs> and the legacy of the Metroid and whatnot. And then other M adds in, you know, what happened after the Metroids all died and all this other crap that really kind of takes away from the the isolationist and the loneliness factor of it because not that not the not the loneliness the mystery that's what I meant to say the mystery of Metroid because like every Metroid game it just it feels mysterious because like it's just you on this planet you don't know what's going on. You're just basically trying to survive and get out. It's, and then here comes all these other games that like just keep piling on all the shit. It's a great vibe. Yeah. The, 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 the game gives you, yeah. which is just, it, I mean, it's just like a, it's, it's just, it's just a dreadful loneliness and like helplessness. Yeah. <laughs> but it feels awesome when you finally do something. And like the yeah. game's designed so well to make you feel like, like there's nothing you could do. And then you do it and you're like, I'm awesome. That was awesome. Yeah. So there's a lot of great moments in the game that make you feel really good. Yeah. Uh, Meowsy's in the chat said, didn't Bob never finish Breath of the Wild? What the fuck does that have to do with anything? Um, Breath of the Wild is too big. <laughs> yes. Uh, I will go. I might. I'm thinking that's the next That's next on the list after I beat uh, yeah. uh, Ocarina of Time, which is going to be put on hold until I beat Dread because I'm having a good time yeah. with Dread. Uh, anyway. Uh, so yes, we definitely recommend uh, Metroid Dread if you yeah. are uh, if if you're considering it. I mean, of course, there's going to be some people who aren't going to like it, but uh, I think yeah. most people will like it, even if you're not into games that aren't so linear. Uh, yeah. Even if you're a little weary about sixty dollar platformers, it's awesome. It, even if you don't like particularly challenging games, I think this is a good um, dip your toe in because it's challenging. But it's also rewarding for when you do mm-hmm. finally overcome that challenge. Ray Zeflin with 37 months says, does the game have any gyro segments? The gyro segments of Breath of the Wild killed me. I have not run into a gyro segment. Yeah, I don't think it has any. Um, uh, Luabix says, I've been saving my Nintendo Gold to buy a full-priced game. Is Dread the game I should use that credit for? I think there's a 90% chance you will like the game. You might be one of those people that just doesn't like, that just isn't going to like it. I don't know. Um, I don't know your taste in games, but uh, it's, I feel like most people are going to like Metroid Dread for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Uh, Joust asks, is it 30 frames per second in handheld though? I heard Um, it is. Uh, I've only really been playing it docked. And it looks beautiful. Docked, so, but. so I've been playing in handheld because mm-hmm. I'm primarily a handheld player and I am not bothered by it. Like there, I've had no issues with frame rate 
or stability or anything like that. Um, I haven't like actually sat there and looked to see if it was 30 or 60 because the game just plays fine. So uh, I don't I think had, that's important. I had one frame dip in one section. That was yeah. pretty crazy. But uh, there was a lot happening on screen and it was I was I was right. running from an Emmy and things were going nuts. So like <laughs> uh, it, it made sense for that to, to be like that. But uh, again, yeah. I'm only playing in docked mode for the most part. Um, so it's a gorgeous game to me. Uh, yeah. I have not. So I don't know. I honestly, I couldn't tell you about the 30 frames per second in, in handheld. But it's not like it's a freaking like a multiplayer shooter. It's not like you need those extra frames. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the Holy Flamingo with the Prime subscription. Hey, Bob, it was my birthday yesterday. Happy birthday. And I just got Happy the birthday. Xbox Design Lab controller. Thanks for the YouTube video the other month for sharing the awesome site. Thank you, the Holy Flamingo. I'd like to see that controller. Yeah. Tweet at me Send or Send us pics. Yeah. Or you can link one in the chat. Um, we had uh, other super chats. Watching the, they're all like one bit, and it's Edward Bova with giant paragraphs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, watching the gameplay on the Clips channel made me really interested. The game just really looks beautiful. It does look really good, but again, that's docked gameplay. Nice game. So yeah, only if that looks good, only play it docked, I guess. Yeah. Uh let's stay on the topic of Metroid Dread. Yes. But let's talk about how you know the real big the real big gimmick here is that uh uh Kotaku wrote this article and everybody took went went nuts. Everybody everybody yes. hated Kotaku after everybody this. piled on Kotaku, yes. So, Kotaku um, wrote an article, Metroid Dread is already running on Switch emulators. <laughs> right. Wh which, is that a bad title? It, it's a fair title. Okay. Because that's what the article is about. It's about people have found a way to get Dread running on a Switch emulator. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a big deal because... Emulation of modern cons of current gen consoles is generally not easy to do. It's generally very difficult because there's a lot of like firmware and other weird system quirks that take a long time for the common folk to figure out. I mean, even like PlayStation 3 is still very hard to emulate. Um, so the fact that they are gotten Metroid Dread running on a Switch emulator is pretty noteworthy. I don't know of any other Switch game or any other... The only other Switch game I know of that they got running on an emulator was Sonic Colors, and that was poorly. <laughs> so... They edited the article. That. The original suggested to emulate if you don't have a Switch. Uh, emulate if you don't want to pay the cash. Are you yeah, sure so about that's that? the thing. Yes, the original article made it seem like... So this article was edited. The original okay. article, I I wish I had saved screenshots of what so, it so, looked so like. So I remember Misclick tweeted about it. Yeah. And this was this was like the day after my panel where some where two people asked me how like how I felt about uh uh emulation for games preservation. And mm -hmm. my answer was something like, uh, listen, uh I love emulation, I do it all the time. Everybody's gonna have like a whole folder of roms however you can't hide behind the guise of games preservation when you're emulating stuff it's still stealing you're stealing the game just know that you're committing a crime <laughs> like there's still hold there's still people out there holding a license you're not high and mighty by hiding behind game preservation S right. sometimes it's the only way to get a game and it's i understand but you're not fucking robin hood <laughs> I, I do feel like there comes a point where emulation not only makes sense, but for the lack of a better term, it is right. Because there are just some games that are unavailable either through licensing issues, being lost to time, or just the publisher or developer does not want to make that game available anymore. 
It just does not care about it. It would rather just let it die and move on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah. There's, it, there's, there's nothing. Sometimes it's the only option, and and, yeah. and well, that's totally fine. Uh, yeah. Laws aren't always, uh, uh, what do you call it? Laws aren't always uh, good or bad. You know. Yeah. Like is jaywalking bad? Sometimes no. you gotta do it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, it's the same thing with emulation. Like you're not like you're stealing. Like even <laughs> if it is a game that is is hard to get right now, like you don't have a Wii U. It sometimes it might be hard to get one. Yeah, or well, it's think, or it's insanely expensive to get some of these yeah. old consoles. So playing I, Metroid Fusion is going to be a problem. It's so much easier to just emulate it. And you know what? I encourage you to go out and do it. But you're still committing I, I a think, crime. <laughs> I think the classic example was, was Earthbound. Yeah, you know, for for decades, the only way to play Earthbound was on a Super Nintendo. And if you never played Earthbound before, if you want to get a Super Nintendo cartridge, it was cost prohibitive. It was like four hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. So for the longest time, the only way to experience Earthbound was to emulate it. Then they put it on the Wii U. So you can play it on the Wii U if you had a Wii U, but nobody had a Wii U. Mm -hmm. So it was still easier and much more you know, cost effective to emulate it. And now we're back in the same circle because Nintendo has not put Earthbound on Switch Online. Uh, I, I'm, I think that there's nothing wrong with emulation. And I think there's nothing wrong with getting some ROMs. Uh, support developers as much as you can. Tell mm-hmm. these publishers you want these games, that these old games to be put on newer consoles and then to make it easier for you to get it. The, I, I think yeah. the best way to fight against piracy is to just make the games as accessible as possible. It worked with yeah. the freaking music industry. Of course it's going to work. And it worked with the movie industry. It's going to work with every other industry. Um the only uh i just don't like people hiding behind the guys that they're like they're like ethically or morally or or right by stealing games <laughs> like you're still stealing the fucking game dude i don't know what to tell you um but sometimes it's just easier man so i mean yeah if you want to be a, 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 sometimes you just got to be a criminal you know just because you're doing uh, something again, illegal doesn't mean you're a bad person to be fair it, the video game industry is notoriously terrible about preserving their own history. Like, yeah. notoriously terrible. So, if it takes committing crimes to preserve the history, then it, it takes committing crimes. Simple so, as that. So, this is what Misclick tweeted. It was, uh... Kotaku tweeted, Metroid Dread is already running great on Switch emulators. Uh, and that's all I saw. I didn't even read the article. And she said, I expected this from children trying to justify their inappropriate behavior, not adults. Do better, Kotaku. I was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Go off. <laughs> I still stick by my opinions on stealing. Sorry if that offends you. Oh, and also buy Metroid games or games in general for that matter. Um, uh, Squid Vorbis put the a link to the original article in the chat. Okay. Uh, let's read the, the original. original. The original version of the article starts with, hey, real quick, if you're a Nintendo lawyer or, a pl- or employee, just like, don't read this. <laughs> It was a silly mistake. Ignore this blog. You can go now. Okay, everyone else. And then the article proper begins. Great. Uh, so Metroid Dread was officially released on October 8th, but copies got on into the wild a few days before that. And even after such a short time, the game is now fully playable in 4K via various Nintendo emulators. Released yesterday and developed by Mercury, St- Mercury Stream, Metroid Dread is the awaited 2D return of the Metroid series. You can read our full review below. Uh, but the short answer, it's a solid game with some nice looking visuals and surprisingly tricky boss fights. It is a Switch exclusive, as you might expect, but all you need is a Switch emulator and a decently powerful PC. And you can play Dread on your computer right now, and it looks great. Pause. The, okay. Pause. So in the revised article, they said it's a Switch exclusive, as you might expect, but because of readily available Switch emulators, people are already able to play Dread on powerful enough PCs. Sounds like uh, the Gawker lawyers swooped in and were like, hey, yeah. we, gotta, we gotta change things up here a little yeah, bit. You gotta fix that. 
Via the popular Yuzu open source emulator, you can now play Dread with custom controls and unlimited frames per second settings. Some players have reported minor issues with cutscenes and black screens, but according to the Yuzu devs, this is uh, fixed by updating the latest version of the free emulator. So the re- the revised version says, <laughs> via the popular Yuzu open source emulator, Dread is already playable to play with custom controls and unlimited uh, frames per second settings, which is to say more powerful, more powerfully than it runs on the native Switch. So the running theme is they've gone from basically saying you can do this to it is possible to do this. Which I think is the better way to talk about it. Like, yeah. Because you're, try- you're not trying to encourage people to do this. Because... Yeah. The difference here, we were just talking about games preservation and old games that are hard to get and people emulating those yeah. and whatnot. Um, newer games, however, you should not emulate because yeah. though they're still available and easy to get. And yes. that is just like walking into a store and walking out with the game without paying for it. Yeah. You is, wouldn't download is- a car. I would, but maybe you wouldn't. I would totally download a car. Um. Anyway, where am I? Uh. Another, another popular, popular Switch, Switch emulator, Ryujinx, is able to run the game at similarly high frame rates, but can also play it at a much higher 4K resolution compared to the native 720p. 720 or 900p resolution available on the Switch in handheld or TV mode. This is a massive increase, and the art style and visuals really shine in 4K. I don't think it's 900p, is it? I thought it was 720p. I think all it around. is. I think it is. Of course, it's possible that certain areas of the game perform worse on certain PC setups, and depending on your computer specs and software setup, Dread is is. Dread via emulation could be a total shit show, but it seems that for most folks with moderately powerful GPUs, things are looking damn good. They're really trying to sell this. In the revised version, it says for for it seems for most people with moderately powerful GPUs, this isn't an issue. <laughs> like, go ahead and do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to play the rest of the Metroid franchise and don't want to shell out large amounts of money on old consoles and games, your best bet is also emulation. As is often the case, Nintendo, like most game publishers, is really bad about maintaining access to their past games outside of the few big sellers. Thank God for pirates, emulators, modders, and hackers. I I feel a little bad. Oh, there's an update at the bottom of, of, yeah. of the first web archive article. Oh, is this the web arc? Wait. No, the web the web uh, archive oh, okay. doesn't have Yeah. Okay, so so this is the one right now that has an update. Yeah. That says an earlier version of the story was understood by many readers to be a direct suggestion to illegally download this just released game. We regret that this interpretation. That is like that is some fucking gaslighting bullshit. Like this is uh <laughs> like this is an ex-girlfriend or something. Yeah. Or an ex-boyfriend. We regret this interpretation. I regret this interpretation that you think I was cheating on you. Kotaku believes emulation is a vital part of the world of gaming, not least when not least when it comes to game preservation. While not directly encouraging anyone to break the law and download games they have not purchased, we believe our readers are intelligent adults capable of making such choices for themselves independently of us. So Game preservation, once again, this is another reason why I hate when people bring up game preservation when they're talking about emulation, because game preservation has absolutely nothing to do with emulating Metroid Dread. The game yeah. just came out and it's available everywhere. Wherever you want to get it, it's not in short supply. You can go to the store right now and get it. Game preservation has nothing to do with emulating this game. With Yeah. I would also like to add that after rereading this part, the sentence, we believe our readers are intelligent adults capable of making such choices for themselves independently of us is basically their way of saying, if you didn't, un- if you didn't get this from the original article, that's your fault. I, I was if, go- you, if you, if you took us really hyping the fact that you can play Metro dread in 4k and you can't do it on the switch and you can get it for free instead of paying for it on the switch. That's your fault that you took it that way. 
I felt bad for Kotaku at first because they're just like, if a YouTuber says exactly what they said, nobody would care. Everybody would be like, yeah, yeah. game preservation. Yeah, it's fair. Uh, emulation so punk rock. Yeah. But since they're like a, a, a gaming journalist outlet, like they're held to a different standard. And when they say shit like that, uh, uh, they weren't expecting the internet no. to just turn on them, you know, because because they they think everybody loves emulation. If I talk shit about emulation, people will get mad, which is a which is I think uh, the, the, the like an obvious way to look at it. At, if you're a if you're a you know news outlet, you, if, yeah. if, I'm sure in the past when they have talked even a little weirdly about emulation, neck beards get all crazy because I have I emulate all the time. You're saying I'm wrong. Yeah. I'm a bad guy. But uh, in this case, they were talking about emulation and everybody got mad. <laughs> they were talking about emulation in a positive light and everybody got mad. So uh, I feel a little bad for Kotaku. But after that update, them trying to pass the buck, I don't feel bad anymore. That's fucking stupid. They're stupid. I mean, Kotaku, especially in recent weeks and months or whatever, um, they, they've been like a very noticeable whipping boy on Twitter because they always like they always seem to be releasing articles now that disagree with I guess is a bad way to put it of disagreeing with the zeitgeist of what modern gaming audiences think mm -hmm. or at the very least try to suck the fun out of the games you're playing you know like they'll find a reason why you shouldn't like this game because it promotes racism or whatever Mm -hmm. And it just it, it ruins. It's just it brings the whole vibe down, and it, it's uncalled for. I th I think they do do some good work still, but it's buried underneath this need to be the bad boys and girls of games journalism, when really you're just coming across like like killjoys. <laughs> yeah, lately Kotaku's been saying a lot of weird edgy stuff and it uh yeah. it's not being received well and again i feel a little bad because uh at the same time of a youtuber like like for example let's uh, spawn wave would never do this but if mm -hmm. but spawn wave is a youtuber that is basically a games journalist he talks about yeah. the news you know and if he said something like this like promoting uh, uh emulation and no one would care Everybody would be like, whatever. It's, 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 that makes a lot of sense. Um, but because it's like a, it's like a, it's a written news outlet, uh, people got a little crazy. Yeah. So, uh, I I feel a little bad, but uh, at the same time, no, I don't. I mean, I understand why. I understand why an article about Metroid Dread being emulated was newsworthy, and I think that that's something that should be reported. But there are ways to report that without encouraging people to go out there and do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And being, I think that's the major failing. We're being asked, Squid Vorbis says, what's your thoughts on MVG's tweet about it? Uh, I don't remember his tweet about it. Uh, I'm trying uh, to I find it right remember. now. Uh, emulations exist. You can cover your... Oh, here we go. Emulations exist. You can cover your eyes and ears all you like, but they exist... Switch games running on emulators day one is news and it should be covered just like when N64 games ran on Ultra HLE on PC in 1999. It's news. Yeah, that's why I kind of feel bad yeah, for Kotaku, but you were here with us when we read the web archive and that was a little weird. The little wording was a yeah. little sus. And their yeah. reaction to the reaction was also uh, not very professional. So, yeah. Uh, but that's again here we are uh, uh, holding Kotaku to a higher standard than we would a regular YouTuber well um, I think they should be held to a higher standard because they've been around for a lot longer they predate YouTube and they're part of Kotaku they're part of Gawker or I don't well, know Gawker's if they are not anymore a, Gawker hasn't been a thing since Hulk Hogan so so, so, so what, uh, what are they are they even in a conglomerate anymore they're in a conglomerate I forget who owns them they used to be owned by Univision, but now they're owned by some, someone else. Hmm. Um, yeah, they're in a conglomerate that owns Gizmodo and the AV Club. And I, I think it's a thing where people... Like there are people who are mad at Kotaku for even reporting on it. That's yeah. a bad take. 
it's the fact that Kotaku, uh, uh, you can be mad at Kotaku for promoting stealing a game that just came out. Yeah. Uh, that I think is a valid criticism about Kotaku. Reporting mm -hmm. on it is not a problem. Uh, uh, promoting the stealing of the game is, is, is a little bit of a problem. Yeah. And then hide again, once again, hiding behind game preservation. I, I got nothing wrong with game preservation, but you can't that's not the excuse for stealing a game. Games it you know, games preservation can only be an excuse when the game isn't brand new. When the game just or, came or, out. Or is lost has, has to time. Had... Like 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 Star Fox 2, uh, uh the original uh, dinosaur planet. Like that when that shit comes out, I'm stealing that. That's freaking. I oh, need yeah. to play that. That's that's, that's like that's a piece of history. Oh well, yeah, that, that's what I'm. That's fine. I'm talking about when a game just comes out, you can't use the game's preservation right. excuse. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, uh, we got Sar zoom in in the chat uh, with two months. I'm sorry. Who says? Uh, what are your thoughts on amiibos for this game? We're talking about Metroid, giving you free energy tank and missile refills. Is this pay to win in a sense or simply harmless? I'm gonna be honest. It's a little bit pay to win. Um, okay. I used uh, the I used my uh, Dark Samus amiibo uh, one time, and it gave me 15 missiles. And uh, nice. 15 missiles really isn't a big deal. You can get missiles pretty easily in the game. Yeah. Uh, but there are amiibos that just straight up give you health. And and uh, it is cheating. It's a cheat. It's a cheat code. I think if, if you have the regular Samus amiibo, it refills your health. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have the specific Metroid Dread Samus amiibo, it gives you a full energy tank. Oh, I got to use in it. In addition to... <laughs> did you get... You have the... I have. Yeah, I have both. Dread, okay. Uh, bring those to mom and dad's tomorrow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I need those. Um, do you wait? Yeah. Hold on. Speaking of that, do you have the air tags? Two. Uh, you're supposed to give me two of those. I gave them to you. When the hell did you get those? Th those might still be at mom and dad's. <laughs> okay, I I'm gonna need those. Um. Okay. Anyway, it reminds me a lot of the uh, amiibo that you get with uh, uh that that came with uh or that came out with Super Mario Odyssey. Those were yes. straight up cheating because any time yeah. in the game. You can just drop uh, an extra three hearts and and uh, and or uh, I think Peaches gave you star power. Yeah. So at any moment in the game, you can just get star power. That's cheating. So I mean, um, to, to this game's credit, to Dread's credit, from what I understand, you can only do it once a day. But I feel like that's still a lot for thirty dollars. So so, so doing it once a day is is understandable. However, giving yourself a full like an extra heart tank is a yeah. little ridiculous that that means yeah. there's a part of the game that is locked behind uh th that is an upgrade to your character that is locked behind a physical item in the real world that seems weird yeah um and it makes you more powerful in the game that's like yeah that that's feels weird i'm gonna use it <laughs> um but yeah uh, anyway uh uh what what am I what am I what am I talking about here? Um Oh yeah, we were reading notifications. Oh Mecha Drag with 100 bits. Welcome back, bros. Hope you all enjoyed the cons you went to. Bob upgraded and purchased a new X Pen drawing tablet last night. I've never heard of X Pen before. It won't let me look for it. Uh X Pen. X Peng? Uh X pen drawing tablet while you do that i found out the amount of physical nes games we have okay 22 holy shit apparently oh. we have two copies of bad dudes on nes which i think is wrong i don't doubt that uh br another brief aside this is very interesting and this is relevant to the podcast um we're done talking about Metroid. Metroid's over. Um, okay. Get it. Get it. It's a great game. Uh, yes. While I was at Too Many Games, there was a WADA booth, WADA Games. Oh, I saw this. Yeah. Immediately next to Heritage Auctions. Yeah. Not even trying to hide hide it. Definitely just paid for one big space and, and cut the booth in half. Yeah. Like, what are they? Th what are they thinking? 
They just, they're just completely that's, shameless about it. That's just some arrogance right there. Like, Either they're completely oblivious to the fact that there's a big controversy going on and that the people who would attend an event like Too Many Games probably are aware of that. Mm -hmm. Or they're like, fuck those nerds. We'll do what we want. <laughs> and here's a picture of John from Small Wave just standing yeah. in front of Heritage Auctions. He he uh, he wanted to get the picture and I was like, I'll take it. Let's do it. Let's do it right now. And then I took it and then he was like, you could post it. So I posted it. That was funny. Now people think he works for Heritage Auctions because of this picture. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, another thing that really pissed me off was there was another there was another uh, uh, vendor. There was a lot of vendors that were the prices for games at too many games. The last couple years we were there, the prices mm -hmm. were great because there's a lot of vendors selling the same stuff together, so there's very competitive pricing. This year. The prices for shit were insane. Mm. I saw Resident Evil Dead Aim, possibly the worst Resident Evil game that exists. Yeah, seventy dollars. Fuck that. <laughs> I saw four. I saw three copies from one vendor. Had three copies of the original Super Mario Brothers in the box, complete in box, open but complete in box. Mm -hmm. Four hundred to five hundred dollars. What what game was this? The original Super Mario Brothers, complete oh. in box, four hundred to five hundred dollars. And absolutely I absolutely not. I I I said the, the guy was behind the counter, and I said, "Excuse me," and he was right in front of me, and he was just yeah. looking at his phone. And I go, "Excuse me," and he didn't look up. He he like he like took a step forward, but didn't look up from his phone. Yeah. And I just said. Okay, and I turned around and walked away. <laughs> but then E grabbed my shirt and pulled me back. And yeah. I looked at the guy. And then he 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 was he went, Yes. And I went, uh, why are these what's the what's the deal with these? Why are they expensive? Like what's the what's the price? Like yeah. why are these this much? And he goes, just the box they're in. What could possibly be different about the box that they're in? Nothing. If they all look the same, then there's absolutely nothing. They all look the same. Uh, it's just the original Super Mario Bros. box. They don't have a sticker on them because they were opened already. Right. It's just the original Super Mario Brothers. So what I did was I immediately bought a case for the one that we have. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I bought for $15. Like four years ago, it's see. This is the that's the part of the problem with what Heritage Auction and Wada Games are doing. They are artificially driving up the price of not just you know the graded video game collecting, but regular ass video game collecting. Because mm -hmm. now everybody thinks they have the next three million dollar game when they don't. They have the most common game in existence. I mean, a complete in box copy of Super Mario Brothers should cost more than just the cartridge itself but mm -hmm. not $400 more. Do you remember when we were at Long Island Retro Game Expo and I found a copy of Pokemon Yellow in the box? Uh, it was Japanese. A Japanese Pokemon Yellow in the box and it was $40. And I was like, yeah. yo, this is mint. This is awesome. Yeah. I'm getting this. And I bought it and I bought it for $40. And I was like, this is awesome. Thank you so much. The guy's like, no problem, man. And he immediately, he went, he, Went under the counter, picked out another one, and put it right back. And it was the same. It was in the same condition. Yeah. It was perfect. It was beautiful. And I was like, "Fuck! I guess it's not rare." <laughs> they had uh, Pokemon Diamond and Pearl and whatever um, Japanese in the box, a hundred to a hundred and twenty-five dollars. Yeah, not a rare game at all. No, but I, I don't. I'm, I'm still not sure if. I mean, I guess these are just the prices of games now. That sucks. It's disgusting. That's cost prohibitive. That's why people say it's okay to pirate. Yeah. Because the games are too expensive. Uh, uh, that's that's games preservation right there. If they're cost prohibitive to buy these games, then yeah, what do you expect people people are going to do? I, I, I don't think I saw a N64 game with a box under $100. It was, that's disgusting. It was... It was yeah, it was bad. It was it, yeah. it's 
it was really sad to see how 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 terrible this this market became yeah um poke shocks is pokemon games are stupid expensive uh, they 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 weren't like a few years ago like like yeah. they're extremely common i mean uh I understand like uh like Pokemon Ruby and and uh, and uh and like Heart Gold and and all that stuff are there's like those like sought after games. So getting a mint version yeah. of that is like is is a big deal. Um but I mean the Japanese original games they're, they're like a, they should be like a dime a dozen. There's so many of them. Yeah. Um uh anyway Thrill House's prices are up, but they were next level there. Hardware was nuts, too. For the most part, hardware was crazy. Japanese games yeah. usually aren't nearly that pricey. Yeah, Japanese games are usually a little bit... Uh, especially yeah. the older stuff, they're usually a little bit cheaper. Yeah. People generally would say, if you're collecting for the NES, collect for Famicom, because you get the same games for a lot cheaper. Uh, I'm just making a note that we talked about this for a while. Um, okay. Yeah, hardware was was insane. There was a I I found uh, an original Xbox Halo, uh, uh, uh original Hex, Xbox Halo edition console, four hundred dollars. Uh -huh. Fuck. It came with a box, but still. Yeah. There's also some N64s that came in the box. One uh, one of them was uh, Japanese. It was the watermelon one that was like two tone. It was right. like pink and and white. Uh, yeah. Four hundred and fifty. Like it was rough. It was rough out there. I remember one year at uh, Long Island Retro Gaming Expo, there were several booths that were selling Nintendo sixty fours for sixty four dollars. <laughs> Any more than that is don't don't buy a Nintendo sixty four. Well, I think I think times are different now. I think I think I I'd really hate for this to be the case, but I think that this is the price. These are just the prices moving forward for these fucking that games. Is very disappointing to me. Yeah. So. Pirate games is what we said. <laughs> yes. Yes. Steel games. Uh, yeah. Uh, Thrill House 100 bits. Nah, that was the $400. That was the special $400 box edition that she's talking about the original Mario Brothers. Um, yeah, yeah. The way I got that was the way I got my original Mario Brothers is I bought the cartridge and it came with the. No. I think I got just the cartridge. And then I went to a store yeah. in like Florida or something, and they had a a, a box and a manual. No, they had a manual and they had a game and a box. And I said, right. "No, no, no! This is what happened. I got the game and the manual, but no box." Right. And then I found the game and the box, but no manual. And I said, "Can I buy just okay. the box?" And they said, "Okay, five bucks." And that's and then uh, now I have a complete in box original Super Mario Brothers for fifteen bucks. There you go. Um. Anyway, moving on. We're running yes. late here. Let's talk about the Switch OLED. There's a new problem that was just discovered. Uh, yesterday. Oh yeah. This article was written today, but somebody tweeted this at me. I think yesterday. Uh, sensitive to PWM flicker. If you don't know what PWM Flicker is, you're not sensitive to it. You'll want to keep the Switch OLED screen nice and bright. Um, I'm not reading this whole article. I'm just going to play this video. Uh, okay. Okay. Wow. Sorry. Here's the deal. Uh, the way that this... So, okay. You know that LCD screens, uh, OLED screens, sometimes even LED lights... They flicker. They 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 turn on and off rapidly. They pulse. It's it's yes. noticeable on certain cameras. It's not noticeable to the naked eye, at least most of the time, uh, or ninety percent of the time. It's not noticeable to the naked eye. Um, the OLED switch does this. It flickers just like any screen does. If you put it in a slow motion camera, you'll see the screen flickering. Um, but. It varies. It, it, if you want to lower the brightness, it doesn't low. It doesn't just lower the brightness. It increases the time between flickers. That's how the 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 brightness decreases. So visually, it looks like the brightness has decreased, but really, what it's doing is it's flickering more, or or, or the flickering is more noticeable. Uh, 
you can try it on your OLED switch. I tried it. It's completely unnoticeable that the screen is flickering. But if you put it under a slow motion camera or even just your phone at 120 frames per second or 240 frames per second, you'll notice some scanned lines and you'll notice it looks like it's flickering. Um, if you look at just this video, you might say, damn, that looks really bad. I don't want no LED switch. But really, the naked eye, you don't see this at all. This is not what it looks like. It doesn't look like this. It, it looks like it's it looks like it's running just fine. Uh, some pe- There are few people where flickering like this might become an issue. If you are one of those people that claims that you can see 240 frames per second on a on a PC, uh, I, that doesn't mean you're somebody who's sensitive to uh, this sort of flickering. Uh, it's not the same thing. Uh, I think they said it's like a thousand hertz, like the like the like the screen is like a thousand hertz when it's when it's at full brightness. So like you you would never. Jeez. Uh, okay, so LCD screens w- such as the one in the regular Switch is also flicker, though the PWM of LCD screens tends to be around 1,000 hertz or more. High, high, higher frequency, so more difficult for humans to perceive. OLED screens, on the other hand, usually have a much lower PWM frequency and can be more notice- noticeably prone to flicker. Again, if you're sensitive to that sort of stuff. And I guess you'll know if you are, but uh, yeah. I, most people are not. This video says screen flickering causes eye strain for some users. This is due to the pulse wide modulation PWM implementation for screen brightness control. Uh, I feel like I have to keep stressing. It's a low chance that you're that you're susceptible to this sort of flicker. If you have mm-hmm. been, if screens have ever bothered you in this way before, uh, definitely like go to a big box store and see if they have a switch on an OLED switch on display. Mm-hmm. This guy's testing it with um he's testing it with auto brightness on, which does it which means he never put it at full brightness. Right. Uh because it gets way brighter when you turn auto brightness off. Uh so if you are if you have an OLED switch and you are susceptible to the PWM flicker, uh you need to play it as bright as you can. But that, I mean, now you're playing. Now you're getting a big, bright screen in your face. So, mm-hmm. uh, again, I'm going to say this isn't that big of an issue. But if you are, if you have felt weird looking at certain screens, maybe look into this. Monkeys, monkey S cases. Bob, what is your video on burn in, on the burn in test coming out when it burns in? And who knows when that's going to happen? You can't rush this thing. I can make a video tomorrow and fucking I'll have nothing to say. Uh, but anyway, that's that. That's the whole article is that there's a, there's a, apparently it flickers really harshly and that could be a problem for, for certain people. Okay. Um, anyway, that's PWM flicker. Will you put an article in here about Joy-Con drift never, ever being fixed ever? Yes. So, uh, should I just sum up the article real quick? Yes. Okay. So... There was a uh, there was one of those Nintendo uh, Q and A with the developers of within Nintendo, and they talked about working on uh, the Switch OLED model. And the company revealed that it had been steadily been making improvements to the Joy Con to try and make them more reliable. The joysticks that came out in the 2019 Switch Lite aren't the same as those that came in the original 2017 model, and they've been continually they've continued to refine them more and more over the years. But uh, Ko Shioda, a Nintendo executive who also serves as GM of Nintendo's technology development division, basically says that Joy-Cons will always wear down over time. When asked, do you mean that basically wear is unavoidable as long as the parts are physically in contact? Uh, Shioda said, yes. For example, car tires wear out as the car moves as they are consistent as there is they're in consistent friction with the ground to rotate. So with the same premise, we ask ourselves, how can we improve durability? And not only that, how can we both op, how can both operability and durability coexist? It's some, it's something we are constantly tackling. Uh, 
The joysticks included in the latest OLED model are the latest version with all the improvements as the joysticks that shipped with the base switch, the switch light, and Joy-Con control, blah, blah, blah. So basically, Nintendo said, we've done everything we can, but wear is inevitable. It's interesting <laughs> they're that they're, they're finally admitting that they've been continuously improving the yeah. analog sticks since launch. It feels like they have not been. Yeah. <laughs> and they said they're it, still working on improvements. Very and it looks like they haven't been because every time they do a teardown, it like it looks the same. I know, and they're keep, we keep finding evidence of them like tinkering with it, and then we found we find yeah. evidence of uh, that that refutes that that they weren't tinkering with it. So I really have no fucking idea what they're actually doing in that thing. They they must yeah. be not doing much. Um, yeah, I honestly thought this article was going to be something about how the uh, the the hack that was found a few months ago wasn't going to work or something. Oh. <laughs> um, but that's good that they're at least trying, but it doesn't yeah. sound very hopeful. I mean, I understand what he's saying because it makes sense. If you keep using your analog stick constantly, it's going to wear down. And it's going to cause problems. I don't think that's, you know, I think that's a fair thing to say for all video game controllers with analog sticks. I think the thing is with the Switch, it happened a lot faster and a lot sooner than I think anybody anticipated, including Nintendo. So... I mean, the, I guess the best we can hope is they find a way to make it durable enough to last more than halfway through a console generation. Yeah, I mean, g game companies always rigorously test their stuff. Uh, wear yeah. and tear is inevitable on everything, especially uh, any sort of device that has physical movement is going to get wear and tear on it. Uh, or yeah. any sort of device that even interacts with a human in any capacity is going to have a uh, physical wear and tear on it. Um, mm -hmm. It just seems like the Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons have more, they're more susceptible to this sort of wear and tear than than is usual. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's a little, uh, it's a little upsetting, but uh, maybe they'll develop a completely different type of input device for their next console, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Speaking of input devices, uh, here is the uh, Design Lab controller uh, King of the Simps got for his birthday, his or her birthday. Ooh, that is a, that is a nice. nice controller. Very nice controller there. Anyway, uh, moving on here. Let's talk about the Steam Deck teardown. What happened? Yes. What do we got here? Valve, Valve released a video uh, showing you how to take apart your Steam Deck. And tells you over and over again, don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> they say it could they... cause physical harm. Yes. So the main the main point of contention is um, the battery is like right there. Yeah. And they, they really try to hammer home the fact that it's it's one of those like soft lithium ion batteries, like what's in an iPhone. And if that gets punctured or damaged in any way, it could legitimately explode. Oh yes. Um, We're well aware of that. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very dangerous. Uh, having said that, um, another reason they say don't do this is because once you take it apart, that actually uh, makes it less durable. It breaks the seal because everything is so tightly packed in there that when you open it up, it breaks the seal and you know, putting it back together will just make it less durable. Um, but the video does show you how to, speaking of joysticks, Remove the thumbsticks to eventually replace them. And Valve said they will have videos in the coming months showing you, uh, letting you know about the new, about when replacement thumbsticks will be available, how to install them properly, and all this and that. And also how to upgrade the SSD in here. The, in the video, they recommend just using a, uh, a micro SD card, but they show you, you can remove the uh, SSD in here, and they tell you what kind of SSD. To replace it with uh, i have to add not just the thumbstick but the entire thumbstick module so like yes not just the top of the thumbstick which will get worn down over time but also the yeah. whole fucking module so that's that's there's you could fix drift or you're on your own here you could just yeah. they, they are not i mean they're saying don't do it but they're also kind of encouraging you to do it yeah. also uh that sort of battery that sort of soft touch battery or whatever yeah. Same exact thing in the Nintendo Switch, and this is what happens if you puncture it with your. This is what happens if you if you uh, t try to take it out wrong and puncture it. We got wood over here. 
uh, with uh, these little jobbies uh, and sparks fly is what happens. <laughs> so uh, don't uh, don't do that. Yeah. Don't put sharp objects near your battery. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to Val's credit, they also show you exactly how to disconnect the battery from the motherboard so that you don't have any immediate problems. <laughs> Right. That's the first thing you yeah. should absolutely do is disconnect it or just wait till I mean wait till the thing's dead is a good precaution yeah. but yeah. Um it's pretty crazy that they're all that they're just they're just out with it. Here you go. This is how you do it. Yeah. I mean it, it still isn't like you know, it's it's I wouldn't call it, you know, a right to repair. And the article too, it doesn't call it a right to repair poster child because Valve still wants you to, you know, use their uh, service technicians to fix it but the fact that they're showing you that it is possible for you to do it yourself is completely at odds with every other tech company right. in the world right now so. i think i think this is a good sign for the steam deck right now uh yeah this is a very very big positive uh again i still i'm still skeptical of the thing i, I don't think, I think it's... this is I think this is smart because the people who would buy a Steam Deck are the kind of people who would probably want to upgrade it themselves. Like we keep saying, this is a very niche, very specialty market device that not many people are going to get. But the people who are going to get it will probably be the type of people who build their own PC and like to tinker with it. Right. So. Uh, uh... I'm still reserving my judgment to see how well things are going to run on it because I still am skeptical yeah. of that. Like, like you could promise all you want that it'll be easy to run stuff, but uh, you know, we've seen in the past that that yeah. doesn't work quite right unless, uh, <laughs> like, like, like it needs to be a, a well adopted product for developers to even want to develop stuff for it. Um, yeah, and sure, it, it'll 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 have things to to force games to run good, basically. But like, I mean, I still I'm still skeptical of that. So until I get this yeah. thing in my hands, I'm gonna reserve my judgment. But this is a good sign. I think it's I think it's great to have uh, this sort of modularity. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, that's that. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, next, let's talk about Battlefield 2042s. Dual entitlement, which is the shittiest name I've ever heard in my life. All right. So to sum this up real quick, EA has their version of upgrading from a previous gen version to the next gen version is called dual entitlement because you are entitled to two different versions of the game. Um, so initially it was only going to be for certain versions of the game, like deluxe, like the deluxe edition and whatnot. But EA has since changed that to make it standard for all versions of the game to be to be eligible for dual entitlement. So the standard version, the deluxe edition, the, the super special edition, whatnot, you all you have to do is buy the base model of the game to get both the current gen and the next gen version of the game. Having said that, EA clarified that dual entitlement uh, will only be a feature as part of the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X and S versions of Battlefield 2042. As such, if you... If you currently only have a previous generation console, you should purchase the new generation version of Battlefield 2042 should you wish to make use of the upgrade system. So if you have a PS4 and you want to play Battlefield 2042, you're better off getting the PS5 version because that way you get both. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not going to upgrade to the PS5 for a very long time. So... I understand it because, like, the next or the current generation uh, games cost ten dollars more. So, right, other companies have seemed to have been confused about how this should work. Because, <laughs> like, <laughs> some companies they they give you some weird ass backwards upgrade system or no upgrade system at all, and then in mm -hmm. order to course correct they make it free to jump back and forth. And that makes it so that why would you ever want to spend the extra $10 and get the next gen versions when you could just get the old gen versions uh, for $10 less? Um, I think this makes perfect sense. 
I wish there was a way to upgrade for an additional $10. Some companies have done that. That's a nice system to have in place. I mean, that, that means that they have to do a little work on the publisher end. But I think the more expensive version, the $70 version as opposed to the $60 version, should get you both. And I think that the $60 version is the cheaper version. You get what you pay for. That's what I think. See, I would agree with you, but we live in a world where smart delivery exists. Mm -hmm. And Microsoft has proven that you can just buy the version for the system you currently have, and it will automatically get you the other version for the other system you don't have yet. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why other publishers haven't really grasped this concept yet, especially when Microsoft offers smart delivery for free to their developing developer and publisher partners. They just can give them the technology to do it. I, and they choose not to. The problem with smart delivery is that if you pay $60 for the game, you get the $70 version for free and you just you just you just, you just uh, you know, screw them out of $10. So if they do okay. that, they need <laughs> I'm sure EA can eat the $10. If you I'm do, sure EA is not hurting for ten dollars. If they do that, they should probably make the old gen version no, seventy dollars. I'm going to tell you why this is okay. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why this is okay, especially for Battlefield, because back in the 360 era, EA was the number one proponent of what was known and what had been EA would call it this, and that everyone wound up calling it this Project Ten Dollars. <laughs> I never Where, heard of this before. You never heard of this? No. This is, I swear to God, look this up. Project Ten Dollars, where you had to buy a game new for full price in order to get the complete game. If you bought it used, then you had to buy and the rest of the game, like multiplayer or certain sections of single player, as a ten dollar download. Okay, I remember this. I remember this now. Yeah. This this was this article so, about Project Ten Dollar is February twenty ten, by the way. Yes. <laughs> so EA has gotten a lot of ten dollars from a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They don't need any more ten dollars. They can afford to give you the next gen version of the game for free. I'm not trying to make EA any more money. Okay. I don't think EA deserves anything. I'm just saying uh the the gaming industry has has a has a pricing problem right now. Yes. Uh with 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 their two uh two console generations of of games. Um they've had a I think this has been a very terrible transition period. And in the past it wasn't really a problem like you just get the version of the game for the console that you want. There's no, you expect if you get a new console, you just got to buy the whole game again. You just got to buy it outright. The whole version of the game, you got to buy it again. Uh, yeah. And nobody ever had a problem with that. Uh, now uh, we're more privileged. <laughs> like there's companies <laughs> like Microsoft who are like, fuck it. You can just have the whole game for free on the, on the new console. You, can just, you, can yeah. just, you don't have to buy it again. You can just have it because we're more connected now. Um, yeah, because I think times have changed. They've realized that when you buy a new phone, because people buy new phones more often, everything just transfers over and it just works. Same thing with when you upgrade your computer. You transfer everything over and for the most part, everything just works. Mm -hmm. So Microsoft is using that mentality for their video game system, which just makes all the sense in the world. Whereas other companies are still stuck in this archaic mindset where there's a clean break in between generations and that hasn't been the world we live in for quite some time now mm -hmm. and it sucks that video games are still lagging behind in that respect they should have been at the forefront of that because they've been going through uh generational upgrades for longer than most other tech companies have see, see a lot of people also have the issue of games being $70 instead of $60. Games went up in price by $10. Right. Um, but we've talked about here on the show, uh, game prices are cheaper than they've ever been. $70 is, is, is nothing. Games should be way more than that for how much they cost to make, how much time yeah. goes into them, and how much they used to cost. 
with inflation adjusted, even without inflation adjusted, games used to cost way more than that. So we're yeah. in this weird area where where like uh, uh, games are cheaper than they've ever been, but people are willing to pay. People aren't willing to pay all that. Um, so uh, again, I think that the games industry is doing. Let me rephrase this. I think the big publishers are doing a very poor job of navigating this space and this pricing yeah. situation. Uh, and part of it is uh, the, this uh, this weird upgrade system, which is very anti-consumer. Um, yeah, it's supposed to be pro-consumer, and people get mad and they want it to you know work work out. But then they, there's always like a little hiccup in in the process that makes it really bizarre and confusing and weird. Um, and yeah. this is one of those situations. Um, but I again, I didn't put it I, in. The I think that EA is doing a better job than most other publishers, aside from Microsoft. I think Microsoft is doing the best yeah. job. I think EA in this Battlefield situation is actually, I would give them an A minus. See, I would give them like a B because I don't think it makes any sense that you have to buy the next gen version to get the last gen game. Who's going to know to do that? Yeah, no one's going to know to do that. Okay, you know yeah. what? I agree with you. The only way they would get an A minus is if you could pay $10 to get the next gen version because that is very and pro consumer. And you know, like I like I said, this is a change because previously dual entitlement was only available to people who bought the hundred dollar gold edition. I'm gonna bring them down to a B minus because that name is fucking stupid. It's terrible. I also, name. this article doesn't say because I know they had dual entitlement for Madden, um, but that only lasted a year. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is also gonna last a year. That's probably because they keep. They put out that new versions of Battlefield like every two years, so I wouldn't be surprised if they like had a hard cutoff on that. It is very stupid to have a time limit on it. Yeah, but for Madden, it kind of makes sense because they're going to make another one next year anyway. Yeah, Madden should be a service. Yes. Yeah. However of, much a you know, year, a give me a new roster every year. Games of service is like the the biggest scam that AAA developers want to do. And I'm shocked that they haven't done that with Madden yet. It's We're all sports games. For that games matter. as a service is a scam that should be way different. It 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 yeah. doesn't have to be a scam. It could work really well for a lot of games. Instead, they scam you in other ways, like Madden yeah. releasing a full price sixty to seventy dollar game every year that is no different than the last year, just with a new updated roster. Or games yeah. like uh, you know, Destiny. Or even like Fortnite, uh, that that yeah. have uh, Fortnite's got battle passes. Destiny has a DLC every few months, um, or or games like Call of Duty, which is the same game every year for twenty years. Just yeah, make it a service and update the service every once in a while. Yeah. Anyway, uh, speaking of scams, <laughs> oh oh, and television is in the news. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll try to go through this real quick. So to summarize, because we've never really talked about it on the show, um, no notable uh, video game musician and all-around unpleasant man, Tommy Tellerico, um, <laughs> is trying to bring back the Intellivision branding. He bought the rights to the Intellivision, and he's coming out with a new console, the Intellivision Amico. It is essentially an overpriced Android console that will feature a lot of ported over mobile games, and it currently costs between $250 and $300. <gasps> um, and it has been delayed several times. It was supposed to come out last year. Um, they continually do um, rounds of investment uh, crowdfunding to try and get more people to like invest in the company and pre-order the system. They just they keep having new in uh, investment rounds going. Um, and they've been generally quiet and like not informative at all about what the system actually is uh well now they are they are selling their physical games for the system that is not out yet and so when you, i say they're you can selling buy the game oh first of all the dpi on that print is trash hold on okay <laughs> Oh no, I think that's so, the, I think that's a the look they're going for. Okay, whatever. I mean, probably. 
And here's the thing. So yeah, they're they're selling the physical box games. But here's the thing about the games. Uh, while it's true that the games come in a nice looking physical package and even come with a nice little collector's coin and cards, the actual game isn't in the box. Instead, what's in the box is an RFID card, which can be used with your Amico one day to unlock access to whatever game is connected to that card. You will still need an internet connection to download the game, but CEO Tommy Tellerico explained that it's only a one-time connection. After that, you'll play the game all you want offline, which is nice. Still, that does defeat the purpose. That defeats one of the main purposes of physical media, which is the ability to have access to the games even after servers shut down or digital stores close. So essentially, what you're buying is an RFID card that you tap against the system and then it downloads and the game is an NFT and it's downloading the (laughs) NFT from their blockchain server. Okay, it's not actually a block. It's not it's not actually attached to blockchain. Let's make that clear. (laughs) That's what they said. That's oh my god, it's it's literally a card. Yeah. And again, it's not like other older video game systems that had cards like uh, the Master System or the Turbo Graphics, which had, you know, credit card style cartridges that you just slip into the game, to the console, and it played the game. You have to tap this against the system and it will download the game. Otherwise, the card is functionally useless. Now, now I, I'm fine with all digital because, like, uh, it's more convenient to just have all of the yeah. stuff on the system all there. But why the fuck would I get a physical box then like there's no purpose to this at all if i I wanted the physical box i would want the cartridge to be in there oh you're not just buying one game bob um they're currently selling the games in bundles uh you can buy one bundle that contains four games for eighty dollars or you can buy all eight games that they're currently selling right now for a hundred and fifty for a three hundred dollar video game system that has been delayed several times and is still not out yet, that is essentially running year years old Android games. They had this weird like assembly line video that looks like it was filmed on an iPhone, and it looks like all right and go. All right, we're filming. All right, everybody. There's so, like eight people on this assembly line putting these games together. There's no reason for this. I, after I read this article originally, and after I watched this weird video, I went back. Like I went on their YouTube channel to see all their other videos. And it's a lot of like weird office tours of like people trying to work and <laughs> Tommy's bothering them. It's a lot of like videos from like events that they have. At, like they had an event at the Crayola factory or at, like a Dave and Buster's in California. And it's like trying to get a, trying to show that this is a family friendly device. And they're mostly showing people playing the device, but not really showing the gameplay footage. And they're, getting reactions but like they're very canned reactions so this has been like a quiet like underground i don't want to say quiet underground thing but like this has been notorious especially amongst like retro gamers uh for smelling like a scam and the more and more the longer this goes on the more clearer that becomes this is because they're real they're really not being forthcoming with a lot of the stuff they really should be forthcoming with. Dude, these guys are trying to eat lunch. And he walks over and he's just putting a camera in their face. Yeah. That's disgusting. Yeah. Not because they're eating, but because he's he's annoying his freaking uh his employees. Yeah. That's so, this is and, so weird. I love this guy's mustache. So this guy's got a sick mustache. <laughs> yeah, he's got a nice mustache. Uh I I should warn you. I've but one time we mentioned in television before, um, I should I should remind us that uh, Tommy Tellerico is notorious for if he hears any criticism, he will just basically bully you into submission <laughs> with all the swear words he knows. Um, he's not a nice man. Um, but at this point, I feel like he needs to shit or get off the pot. Because if he's if he's selling games, then that means that the the system is done because you can't make games if the system's not done. You can. And it's just not good to do that. Yeah. 
But that's so, the thing, uh, is that you tap into the console and it downloads the game. So you can finish the game whenever you want then. The game right, doesn't have to be but, finished until the console's finished. Because you just tap the game, because it has to download it. So it doesn't matter. But then why sell the physical games? Because he's, clearly- he's fucking out of his mind, Will. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't make any sense because because he's got investors people crowdfunded this thing he has to show that it's being worked on and it's 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 gonna that, that that there's physical tangible things that he's got to keep people happy so he's just drip feeding this i understand why he would do this stuff but it's just it's it's sad and, and it's weird and it doesn't make any sense so there's this, that. This will have Earthworm Jim on it, right? Or am I getting the console? Yeah, wrong? no. This this will have Earthworm Jim. Okay, another weird because, one. That that guy yeah. apparently has some that's some weird. Uh, yeah, he, he's uh, got takes. a lot of, lot of lot of bad takes. Um, and I guarantee you, Earthworm Jim is not going to be the system seller they think <laughs> this it's going to be. Um, you know, our PO box is in our channel description so if you want to send us a device to test it we'll be more than happy to do so just to Uh, prove that the thing exists because right now i don't think it does i i can almost guarantee we'll have some things to say (laughs) (laughs) judging by what i've seen i mean a collectible coin can only sway me a little bit uh anyway real quick uh yes oh wait we got just notifications uh seven thank you for the not uh, six months been a while since I was actually awake for one of these. Have a, a 4 a.m. sub. Thanks, dude. Wake up. You got things thank to you. do. Thank you. Pixel yeah. Lord, thank you for the two months. I appreciate it. Uh, now we got Marvel's Avengers to talk about real quick. Yeah, speaking of live service games that are uh, technically scams. All the uh, characters Marvel's... look so ugly. So I actually started playing this game before oh. uh, I started playing Metroid Dread. I'm not very far. I don't know where I am in this game in terms mm-hmm. of progression-wise. But this game starts off so promising. It really does. And then it takes a hard left turn into we really want you to play this multiplayer. Because even while you're playing single player, and there's it's it's got this weird divergent path, not intentionally, where it wants you to play multiplayer, but it still has a lot of single player stuff to do. And you got to do both in order to complete the story. That's annoying. It. You know, the, you know, in like Call of Duty or like other multiplayer focused games, there's always that mission where you have to stand in a circle and defend the circle until like the wave of enemies yeah. is dead. That's in the single player campaign of this game. So they make you do that in single player. That's not a single player mechanic. I've seen this single player games all the time. Not like this. They, they do this. Exa- it's th- set up exactly the same way it's done in a multiplayer game. Okay. It's just it's it boggles my mind because i was honestly enjoying it up until up until it it says all right now you're basically now it's basically a multiplayer game i hope you got friends and it's worse it's like when borderland says you can play this single player when you really you can't it's worse Mm. than that it doesn't like give you ai to play with you it gives you ai but it's like useless you might you mostly wind up doing it all yourself and the menu system is very confusing like it, it really makes no sense there's a lot of like stats and updates that they expect you to keep track of when it's really hard to do unless you just sit there and go through every single one mm-hmm. and that takes almost as long as it takes to go through an entire level so i i want to try to like finish it maybe when i'm done with dread but like it's just it's it was a hard left turn it was very disappointing um even more disappointing now the game is selling xp boosters Paid consumable items called Heroes Catalysts in the game's marketplace as part of an update uh, that rolled out on Thursday. The change isn't sitting well with many players who say that the developer has gone back on its pledge to only offer paid microtransactions for cosmetic items like skins and other flourishes. Yeah, this is literally the exact opposite of that. (laughs) Yeah. So, like I said, I'm not very far in the game. I don't even know exactly, like, where progression-wise I am. Um... But like, like I said, the menu system is very confusing. So I don't even know like what the XP would do, why I would need any more if I'm progressing at the right level to get XP on my own. It's just it's very baffling. It's very decision. clear that this was a, a, a linear single player game that was uh, a shoehorned into being 
uh, weird, always online uh, uh, multiplayer game with microtransactions to to, yeah. to try to squeeze as much money out of people and have as long yeah. of a life as possible. Um, that's yeah. probably why the menu system is bizarre. Apparently, I, I, this was a very expensive game to make, and uh, as of now, it. Square Enix has not made any has not recouped its budget for this. <laughs> I uh I mean I kind of get XP boosts for games like World of Warcraft. Maybe you haven't played in a while, yeah. the new the new expansion pack comes out and you want to play the new expansion pack. So like you just get boosted to level 80 or whatever it is to play the new expansion pack. Um I, that doesn't look like that's how this works. It just looks like you just yeah. get some XP. It just looks like you just they just throw some XP at you. That's weird. Yeah. Um I can't. I I I haven't seen any redeeming qualities about this game. I, I only ever see people like it's good. I have fun. That's all I ever hear. I don't hear the any only, good only, reasons why it's good. I the one thing I constantly hear is that the single player campaign, when it's actually like a single player campaign, is actually not bad. Like the story is like the story is good. The moment to moment gameplay is enjoyable. And like I said, honestly, I was enjoying it for a while. There were parts of it I thought were really cool there were clever takes on some of the characters despite the fact that they you know look like the stunt doubles of from the movies but you know that hard left just like kind of hurt yeah so yeah i uh well i have zero reason to ever pick up this game yeah uh lastly Really quick, let's talk about Universal Studios bringing Pokemon to the... Oh, listen, I... Yeah. This... I know Pokemon Company is a little different than Nintendo, but uh, this was inevitable. Why was there not a Pokemon theme park in, in Japan? There is Pokemon stores everywhere, and they kind of feel like theme parks a little bit. Yeah. I'm sure this was... You know, I'm sure that po the Pokemon Company saw the good relationship Nintendo had with Universal Studios, and I'm sure, you know, Nintendo helped facilitate this uh, combination of at, Theme Park Man. At and... this point, why even go in with Universal? Just do it on your own. I mean, you gotta, you gotta think about it like this. Either you start a theme park on your own, which is a lot of time and money and resources, or you just join a... Uh, somebody who already knows how to run a theme park true and let them help you do it true i'm sure there's there's a lot of like time and money that they saved by just joining universal uh anyway they're adding a, a pokemon attraction to the theme park at universal studios and the pokemon company they shared in a new release on wednesday uh beginning on the 20 uh beginning in 2022 the two companies will enter a long-term partnership to explore the new entertainment to um, immerse park guests in the world of pokemon the new attraction will combine uh real and virtual experiences to create a new quote revolutionary park experience according to the release Quote, Pokemon is beloved by fans around the world. We are honored to have a long-term partnership with the Pokemon Company while de developing groundbreaking Pokemon entertainment at Universal Studios Japan for both Pokemon fans and our guests. J.L. Bonier, president uh, and CEO of Universal Studios Japan, said in a statement. The release did not give any specifics, as you could probably expect. Uh, it sounds like uh, they said uh, uh, phys like like physical and virtual stuff. So uh, they 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 might be going like a Pokemon Go route. Maybe there'll be some sort of like uh, like AR integration with your phone or something. Yeah. Um, I know now, the, it, the Nintendo World. App? So Nintendo World has like a watch. Yeah. Uh, I'd imagine this would be like a mobile device situation, but maybe, maybe they, uh, you know what? It's probably going to be a mobile phone thing and also yeah. buy our proprietary Pokeball. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also of note, they made Super Mario World in Universal Studios. It's there now. Uh, mm. this is only in Japan. Uh, they have, they're adding Donkey Kong. Yeah. And it says 2024. So now it looks like they're going to add Pokemon. Now this says beginning in 2022, they'll have a long-term partnership, but I'd imagine they're not going to have anything for a really long time. Oh, yeah, no. 
Uh, but I think this makes a lot of sense making like a Pokemon yeah. area. I think I don't I don't know why freaking Donkey Kong makes any sense, but Pokemon <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. I think that's it, right? Yes. Danty Mira, thank you for the 26 months. Mo- 26 months. Happy 26 months, Bob and Will. Thank you very much, Danty. Thank you. Uh I I for I you know what? Oh, I do. Here we go. Surprise, bitch. It's me. My own tweets. This tweet of the week. Spawn wave in front of Heritage oh. Auctions. There it is. Boom. There you Done. go. I forgot to do the tweet of the week. I'm so sorry. This was just <laughs> on my screen. Uh, anyway, uh, now we'll talk to you people very briefly because we're running out of time. Yes. First, we will run through the comments uh, picked from last week's Wolf Den Podcast over on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Wolf Den Podcast. Starting with Lou the Lunatic. Uh, how do you not have a cold brew maker, Bob? You I are do a now. super coffee nerd. LOL. Anyways, I hear the KitchenAid cold brew is really good. Great episode. Did you get the OXO one I recommended? No, uh, I forgot that you recommended anything. I got the Hario one. Um, okay. Uh... The instructions are. Why did I do this? I could have just. I could have just done this. Uh, the instructions are all in Japanese. Uh, so, ah. but I could. It's very easy. I can figure it out. Now I have to defend myself here. I didn't get this because I'm a weeb. Okay. <laughs> I have a lot of Hario stuff. Hario is a very well-known coffee, uh, coffee peripheral brand. Uh, they, if you go to a coffee shop, you'll likely see a lot of Hario stuff. I have their uh, their scale, which Will bought me. Yes. Uh, I have uh, their pitch, one of their pitchers. I have their V60. They make, I think, the most popular V60. Their V60 paper is the best V60 paper you can get. And uh, then I bought this because I figured it, that they're a good company, so why not? And it was pretty cheap. It's only 19 bucks. Uh, and I think Wood just bought it now too. I just Wood just got a Breville machine, and I was walking him through how to use it today. Um. Anyway, uh, next, what else we got? Uh, Alan Aguilar, uh, question for Bob: What is the coffee grinder that you use, and why should I buy it? And question mm-hmm. for Will: I've never read a Superman comic, and I'm interested in reading Red Sun, but I would love to hear recommendations from you. So, uh, to which ones you would recommend? You you first, because I'm uh, okay. I'm gonna look this up. Uh, if you want to read Superman Red Sun, as long as you have a basic understanding of Superman's origin, I think that's a good comic to read, um, because it's a nice twist on what you expect a Superman comic to be. Uh, that said, if you want good classic traditional Superman stories, uh, All Star Superman is the one everybody recommends. So I guess read that. Uh, I would read uh, definitely if you want something more modern, Peter Tomasi and Patrick Gleason's run on Superman from the Rebirth era that introduces Jonathan Kent as his son, and he's teaching his son how to use his powers. Um, it's very good. Um, so those are definitely my top picks. I would also maybe recommend. Uh, well, what was that one I really liked? Just do Peter Tomasi and Patrick Leeson's uh, Superman run from the Rebirth era. Check that out. That's good stuff. Um. Okay. So the first grinder, I the first real grinder I got. So the Breville Barista Express, the Breville Barista that I have can come with a grinder. I hear that that grinder sucks. So I decided I'd spend the same amount of money that I would have on that upgraded version with the grinder. Instead, I would get a separate grinder. I'd get the Breville without the grinder, and I would get a separate grinder. I got this hand grinder. It's a Kinu, another Japanese one. Uh, It's a hand grinder. It was $200. It's a very good hand grinder. It's very expensive for a hand grinder. And hand grinders are pretty inconsistent. So I ended up needing to upgrade from this. It's a great grinder, but uh, it's not going to do, it's not going to really help you that much. Uh, I wanted a hand grinder because I don't have a lot of room and I wanted to be relatively quiet. Um, but it just doesn't do the job. Uh, I upgraded to this uh, Baratza Sete seven, uh, 270 WI. The reason I got this one, this was pretty expensive. It was 550 when I got it. 
The reason I got this one is because it goes by weight. You can just press the weight that you want. It's already set to 18 grams, which is the weight that I need for my for my uh, for my espresso machine. You just put the portafilter in, you hit 18 grams, boom, it pumps out 18 grams. It's awesome for that. The first one I got broke very easily, and it was a huge pain in the ass. I don't know if I can recommend this grinder. It's very cool, and I like it now, but uh, it's hard to recommend because of all of the problems I've had with it in the past. Uh, so I guess it's a buy-at-your-own-risk type of thing. Try it out for a month or two and see if you like it. Maybe, hopefully, you can get a refund. Check out the refund policy. I don't know, because it's very expensive to, for a grinder that you might end up having problems with. Also, if you want something a little cheaper, 60 bucks. I got this one for the office. It's it's a Heox. It's a knockoff of a Timor. Uh, it's really good. It's just a it's just a good, cheap hand grinder. Uh, I use it for uh, a lot for French press. Not so much for espresso. Uh, I don't know if it's good for espresso. I don't know if it gets that fine. But uh, it's very good for French press. Uh, so, again, I have the Barazza Sette 270 WI. I don't know how i don't know how to if i could recommend it yeah uh, i'm sorry uh, the barazza there's a barazza that's uh i think the encore is one that most people get uh look into that maybe it might be cheaper i don't know i would also like to just say i remembered that i used to make videos for this channel and one of them was a was a list of five superman comics you should read outside of the ones everybody else recommends and there's some good stuff on there so check that shit out <laughs> Uh, if you found it, put it in the chat. Uh, I I will do that. Um, U20 says, how is Discord so laggy for you guys? Don't you like live like 20 miles away from each other? Will's video is like 10 seconds behind his voice. I'll be honest, he looked a lot better today. But uh, it, I feel like it's a computer issue. It's not a Discord issue. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it's a problem on my end or if it's a problem on your end. Because like... It's definitely a problem computer, on your end. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's your computer. It's your computer. All right, I don't... I was going to wait till next year to buy a new computer. I don't want to buy one soon. Uh, uh, blame it on the on the on people like Mew20 who are complaining about it. I don't see okay. anyone else complaining in the chat. People don't seem to give a shit. Um, anyway, this is a podcast. Stop looking at us. I did see apparently <laughs> Apple's going to have an event knocked in later this month. Hell so yeah. Maybe that will. Maybe that will finally be the MacBook one. Uh, I'm pretty sure it is. And I'm definitely getting a new MacBook. Uh, Lord of Cicadas. Maybe the real 4Ks, just the friends we made along the way. Oh, I wanted to talk about this. I talked to Spawn Wave over the weekend. Yeah. And I kind of grilled him on the whole uh, uh, Switch Pro situation. Because, you know, the Spawn cast is all like they're, they're basically peddling the Switch Pro pop propaganda. Yeah. Got to be honest. I'm on board. I'm a believer now. I think there's a Switch Pro. Oh, really? But not a Switch Pro. I think that the 4K, the dev kits that everybody has, I think that's the next Switch. I don't think it's a Switch Pro particularly, but I believe them now that the dev kits are out there. Anyway, last one, we got Wedged, who says, big coffee guy. I don't know what that means, but thanks, dude. I think it means he likes coffee. Um. Anyway... Uh, All right, now we're with you people. You know, there's some cheap Mac Minis. Someone was just telling me they got a Mac Mini for, like refurbished for like 500 bucks. One of the M1 yeah, ones. Yeah, I like. I was looking at the Mac Minis honestly, and it, it like it was tempting, but I do like the ability to just take this with me. Mm -hmm. You know, just unplug it and go. So I would have to seriously like rethink my whole situation then. <laughs> Well, if I this podcast made any money, we can get you a laptop, but it doesn't. So, All right. <laughs> so Bob and Will, do you guys hear that? Did you guys hear that Nintendo's UK Twitter account said announced that all N64 games will run in 60 hertz? Uh, yes. Oh, that, that should have been. I, a... I meant to. Yeah, I meant to put that in the. All my show notes got lost, so I was scrambling before the show to like add them back. But yeah, I did see that. that so that it, is a good thing. So for our UK listeners. I don't, if you were worried, I don't know why you would be. Uh, all N64 games uh, on the on the uh, on the N64 app for the Switch Online will run at 60 hertz, and I think some of them will have the option to go to 50. I think that's what yeah. they said. Yeah, um, some of them will have the option to play in, in the original format. 
or the original UK format. Uh, should, which again, I think it's it's not I, just the UK. I think it's all of Europe. Yeah, well, whatever. I I, I don't yeah. know anything about geography outside of America. Well, <laughs> I'm an ignorant American. Um, again, I don't think uh, the the uh, the 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 what do you call it the frequency i don't think it uh yeah i don't think it's that really that big of a deal because most of these n64 games ran way way under that it's a it's a deal for certain games where where the frame rate does matter because it 50 50 hertz versus 60 hertz that does mean it's a slower game it's a slower version of a game and we saw with the playstation classic mini console that for some reason have uh, 50 hertz games and 60 hertz games on the same system, that the 50 hertz games ran significantly worse. Yeah, and that's so a I, big deal for stuff like Super Nintendo, where games like Mega Man X are way slower when you're playing the 50 hertz yeah. European version. But the N64 doesn't have many games that run above 30 frames per second. Well... F Zero is really the only one that I think is going to have an issue. You got to remember that the way TVs worked back then, mm -hmm. yeah, it was 60 hertz, but that was 60 hertz interlaced. So mm -hmm. when everything was working properly, that meant it was a that meant it was technically 30 frames a second. And over in Europe, that was slowed down. So instead of it running. At 50 hertz, so it would run at 50 hertz, which means it would be 25 frames a second. Ah, uh, so, so you're so, so, so the you're clock removing... speed is just is just entirely slower. Yes. Okay. It's very different. I'd like to and see a comparison. That, I'm sure. I'm sure there are, you can find comparisons. GST says it's also an issue with audio. The songs get all weird. Yeah. Uh, again, I know that with Mega Man X because it makes sense. That game runs at a full sixty, but then it runs fifty yeah. in in Europe. Yeah, and so I think it's because that that had to be done back during the standard definition era where CRTs ran at fifty hertz. But now that everything is HD, and that means everything across the world uh, runs at the same frame rate. The fact that they're giving you the option to play, you know, the sixty hertz version. I think is the best way to handle it. It sucks right. that they probably won't be localized for your region, but you will have the option to play your localized version. Uh, anyway, let's just take like one or two more from these okay. guys. And then we're, we're in the chat, by the way. Yeah. In case that wasn't clear. Nintendo Life did a good video about the regional differences. Okay. Well, they're European, so that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh... Uh, did you see Mario 64, yeah. but all the polygons are wrong? Yes, I did see that. Um, yes, I did. <laughs> so somebody took Mario 64 and uh, randomly changed all of the... Uh, or randomly added and and subtracted values from all of the surfaces. Yes. So everything looked fucking weird and shitty. Um, and that's it. That's the story. Yes. Um... Anyway. Uh, what's the website you buy your comic books from? Uh, Comixology, if I'm buying digital. Um, that's going to merge with Amazon's Kindle store because Amazon owns Comixology. I don't know when, and I kind of hope it's soon because the fact that the two stores are separate things is kind of stupid. Um. Physical comics? There's a website called mycomicshop.com that has a lot of stuff. I actually have to order from them because I was able to complete my Teen Titans collection except for one comic that they didn't have in New York Comic Con. And it was haunting me the whole day. <laughs> so I have to now go buy Teen Titans 18 from 2003. But mycomicshop.com uh, is good for physical comics. Uh, did you know, Will, our friend Joe Corallo has a comic, a Comixology original? I forgot the I name of it. I think I did know it's that. It's coming out soon, I think. Yeah. I, I ran into him at Comic-Con, and he told me. Oh. 
Uh, Greater Ginny, Mr. Bob, Mr. Will, I just took advantage of the GameStop trade-in deal for my Xbox One. Oh, God. Should I cash in yes. my PS4 to get a PS5 or wait for the refresh and trade in my version one Switch for the OLED Switch? Listen, man, you got a lot of things you need to figure out within yourself. <laughs> I can't. That's a lot of decisions I can't yeah. help you with. I have barely ever traded in anything in my life. We're hoard We're game hoarders here. Yeah. Um, I, GameStop does sometimes have really good deals with trading stuff in. Uh, yeah. It's very rare, though. I I don't know. I don't. I don't. I feel like I can't help you d d d d d uh, judging the validity of trading in old stuff. Because again, I'm a hoarder. I like to keep everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, Land Shark Kid says, "What's some recent comics that you've been reading?" Sorry if I missed it. Uh, I've been enjoying or Ordinary Gods, Booster Gold, and United States of Captain America. Um. So I'm not reading as much as I think people probably assume I am. I'm reading both Batman and Detective, and I like Detective a lot better. I think it's doing a lot more with the interesting concept of Bruce Wayne is not as rich as he used to be. Um, I'm also reading Superman 78, which is basically a continuation of the Christopher Reeve Superman movie, and that's very good. So is Batman 89. Um, and I'm reading the ongoing Star Wars series at Marvel, which is a lot better than I think people are giving me a credit for. It's currently in a crossover right now, but you don't need to read everything in order to understand what's going on in that crossover. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right. I think we got to leave. It's we're way over. Okay, guys. Oh yeah. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for chatting with us. As always, the Wolfden Podcast is every single Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on twitch.tv slash Wolfden. If you can't make the show for any reason at all, we always put it up as an archive version over on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Wolfden Podcast. So you can go watch us on demand over there whenever you want. If you prefer to listen to us rather than watch us, you can do that as well. We're also an audio podcast on anchor.fm slash Wolfden Podcast and your preferred podcast service of choice. But no matter where you get this content from, folks, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us because that helps us with placement on all of those respective platforms. I don't know when the hell I'm streaming next. I really want to stream tomorrow night, but I doubt that's going to happen because I have a lot of work to do tomorrow, uh, meaning Wednesday. And I got to go away this weekend. I might not stream until Sunday night. And even Sunday night, oh. I might not stream. <laughs> I'm sorry, Twitch people, but I, I'm a very busy man. Uh, make sure you're subscribed over on youtube.com slash wolfden with notifications on because all of my focus goes towards those videos. It's very important that I do that stuff. Um, where am I at now? Who's online right now? Who do we got here? Um, it, let's see here. Is E at the studio? He is. I think so. Uh, he's playing Metroid. Let's go give E a watch because I was supposed to raid him the other day and then I didn't. Uh, guys, go watch E and I will see you. Uh, when I see you, I have no idea. Uh, but thanks for making it this far in the video and the podcast, guys. Uh, go say hi to E. Goodbye. Goodbye.